meeting of the North Reading School Committee to order for the <clears throat> 13th. We have a chunky agenda tonight due to the fact that our last meeting had to be canceled because we didn't get power at the school till around late afternoon or early evening. So we'll try to go through it as quickly as possible. First order of business, as always, is public input. Is there anybody here who wishes to be heard on any item that is not on the agenda tonight? Mr. Jeff Simons. You want to, could you pass that microphone over to him just for? Hi, Jeff Simons. And um, just wanted to, couldn't be with you last time when you were, um, recognized me. I appreciate that for the, the gift that I made to the school department through John. And as a, as, as a way of uh, kind of a thank you for everything the school department's done for, for my family. And I just wanted to give you a quick update. It's uh, um, about 26 years since I've been starting to come to school committee meetings when my son Nathan was three years old. Uh, for those of you that don't know Nate, um, he came into the school system after early intervention. He has um, Down syndrome and started an adventure that, uh, that led me in a lot of different directions here with, the, with my relationship with the school committee. But um, the, the gift that I made, if, a few weeks back was just yet another way to, to say thank you for everything that uh, that you as a school committee, John, the administration, all the teachers have, have done over the years. Um, but I thought I'd just give you a quick little update, um, maybe something you don't hear too often, a little longitudinal study here because Nate came in and uh, started going to the little school before it got reopened, uh, back right around the same time that David Troughton came into the system. And so I had a lot of uh, Good memories when with at the ceremony we had for David a few weeks back, um, and he was instrument absolutely instrumental in in uh, really opening up the North Reading school system for students with disabilities, um, and m making sure that we educated all children. And he I, I caught that very distinctly when he made his comments too. And this was something that he really took to heart, and and so have m most of the school committees over the years, and um, and. Uh, a lot of changes got made in the school department over the years that were terrific and still, I think, benefit a lot of people today. Um, very proud of that. Um, started coming to school committee meetings to advocate for kids with disabilities. And while I was there, heard about this little problem we were having about schools weren't big enough and we needed <laughs> to rehab a few schools and build a few new ones. And here we are 20 years later and that all happened. <laughs> um, but Nate, uh, Nate uh, is just turned 29 years old having come into the school system at age three. And uh, he is now living independently, completely independently, just moved into his own apartment in Coolidge Corner in Brookline. Um, he's working full time at Children's Hospital uh, in Boston. Um, and it's just been an amazing year. And there's no question in our minds that it, it all goes back to lots of different factors over the years, including how included he was here, the attitude of his fellow students, teachers, support of administration, school committees. Uh, back in the days uh, when we started with school committees of Colleen Dolan and Victor Hernandez and Janet O'Neill and Karen Stewart and Nancy Sardella, Steve Jervy, and we organized field trips and went off to into <coughs> Boston schools to see how uh, inclusion could be done and learned a lot, brought a lot of those practices back. Uh, David's support too, um, you know, on through Jerry and Mel and Trish Colella and people that really supported us over the years. Um, <coughs> uh, principals, teachers, Pam Cristodulo, teachers that are still here, Laurie Johnson, Kathy Bythrow, Nick Damiano, Catherine Jones, Chris Davis, Kathy Bythrow was one of Nathan's, that was a, like her first experience in the school system, was a assistant teacher in uh, Laurie Johnson's room and uh, mentored by Talita Gibson. Uh, Charlie Jones was fantastic with Nate. Um, directors, pupil personnel directors, Sam Bolognese and Chris Donju. Uh, John and Nate came to the high school at the same time. Uh, that was a fantastic relationship as well. Uh, so it's just, um, you know, you really, really want to thank you, and, and I think you should be really proud of the job you've done over the years. It really makes a big difference in people's lives, uh, kids' lives, students' lives, and you probably don't get a chance too often to see what happens, you know, 25 years later <laughs> from some of the decisions you made um, in, in the course of what you do. It's really important. Uh, thank you very, very much. really appreciate it. 
Thank you, Jeff. I mean, you've been, um, <clears throat> your volunteer time on helping us get the school projects uh, approved, especially that second round of funding for this project, which wasn't to, which wasn't very easy to sell initially. Um, and, and I think also, you know, with you working behind the scenes and with Nate, this is a, this is a strongly, this is a district that strongly leans toward inclusion whenever possible, and it's still the case today. Um, it's been our experience that if you can educate a child in their, his or her own school district with their friends, the results are almost always gonna be better, provided you can provide the same mm -hmm. educational program that they might get elsewhere. So I, th I think that your efforts, starting with Nate way back 26 years ago, um, continue to live on today in, in what we do in the school system. And it's something that, <coughs> as long as I'm around another year and a half, um, <laughs> will continue to push. And I'm sure, no, I'm sure it'll be continued to be pushed by future school committees and, and future administrations. So thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes. It's hard to believe Nate's 29. And I, and I, <clears throat> I think uh, we're probably more attuned to what, uh, what's going on in Nate's life because he's on the news so much. <laughs> he's had some really, some really nice stories about him, Jeff. Um, as you said, I became the principal in 2003, Nate was a freshman that year, and I think uh, it's fair to say that because of him and a lot of other fine kids like him and families like you and Pat, we are a better school district. The, the, you've given a lot of gifts over the years, but I think the two kids you sent through this school district are probably the better, best gifts you've given. You're a classy guy. Thank, thank you. you. Anyone else? Oh, yeah, I just, I just want to thank you too, Mr. Simons, because <clears throat> I mean, when I when I moved to North Reading and found out my son had some special needs, <clears throat> excuse me, and I don't know everybody in the town, I wanted to get involved as well, and so I started attending NRU meetings, and I met you through that, and kind of saw the example of, of a father who wanted to be involved in Absolutely. his child's education, and you know, through you and a few other people in in that group, that really inspired me to start coming to meetings and. I guess I'll blame you whenever I'm <laughs> planning in the future, but you, know, you, you really were an example, and you know that was my idea from the very beginning was I wanted to be involved in the schools that my kids are in, and especially with a child that has some spe special needs, I wanted to make sure that I knew what was going on in the schools and you know had uh, some influence over you know how, making sure that everybody was edu educated, and you really were the example for that. So thank you. You're very welcome. Anyone else? Um, I would just like to say thank you for everything that you've done. You've been a mainstay in this town for as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Janine. <laughs> One more comment. Um, when I first moved here, um, knowing that we had a pretty big project in front of us, and asking who's the gentleman that keeps taking pictures and, <laughs> and, um, and hearing that you didn't have current students. Yeah. I was quite impressed with your dedication of time and effort to a project that really wasn't affecting your, your own children. And um, I thank you on behalf of my current students and my children here. I appreciate it. Thanks. That wasn't the original plan. <laughs> the original plan was for my students to, my right, students exactly. to benefit from this. That was the original plan. The right, timeline exactly. got extended a little bit. Our so. kids would have <laughs> taken advantage of it, but we stuck with it. But well, thanks again, Jeff. Got to finish what you start, right? Thanks again. <clears throat> See you tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, next uh, we have our student report. And I believe this is, uh, is this your debut? Yes. We have Caitlin Galvin from the class of 2018. Weren't you here though? Were you here with the I was uh, here with Model UN, Model UN? Yes. Yeah. So you got practice in. So Caitlin's going to give us uh, what's going on at the high school. Caitlin. Thanks. Coming off a long weekend and with pep rally and Thanksgiving right around the corner, things are really busy at NRHS, especially for seniors. <coughs> November 1st was the first early action deadline for applications for a lot of colleges. and. November 15th this Wednesday is another deadline. So students are going to be continuing to sending their applications in the coming weeks and months. And um, we recently had elections in civics and government classes for seniors to send two representatives to the State House in April to participate in Student Government Day. Those representatives will be myself and Abby Payne. And we will get a chance to learn about the legislature and maybe the judicial branch and kind of actually get to experience voting on legislation and we're both really excited about that opportunity and in the world of fine arts the nrhs marching hornets competed in the mica finals in lawrence on the 29th they earned a bronze medal and they're incredibly excited about that um, 
and Massacre's production of Beauty and the Beast will open on December 1st and 2nd and continue the following weekend. Tickets are available on ticketstage.com and they would absolutely love to see everyone there. It really means a lot to them to be able to see the support of the community and all of their productions. And um, they'll be holding a Beast Brunch on December 3rd. It'll be an opportunity for photos with the characters as well as games, activities, arts and crafts. And an opportunity to use the flight rigging will be raffled off just for attendance. And tickets are on sale, so if you know anyone from Maskers, be sure to contact them, and they would love to see you there. You can get the Beast Brunch tickets online too, correct? Yes, I believe so. Um, and if athletics, fall sports are pretty much wrapped up, with sports awards are going to be held tomorrow. The girls' volleyball team fell to Arlington Catholic in the first round of the playoffs. They finished off their season 11 and nine. And girls soccer also finished off the regular season um, and entered the first round of the playoffs. They lost on the same day as the volleyball team and f falling in double overtime, two to one against Swampscott. But Drillon, Meredith Griffin, Juliet Nadeau, and Kirsten Bradley were all named All-Stars. Juliet and Kirsten were also named to the Eastern Massachusetts All-Star teams, and Juliet will be an All-State All-Star. Wow. And in boys soccer, they ended their season 4-11 and three overall. And senior Nick Carpenter was named a first team All-Star. Ian Branconier, also a senior, was named a second team All-Star. Field hockey also had two All-Stars. Um, senior Emily Warren, our goalie, was named a second team All-Star, and um, Olivia Esposito was named a first team All-Star. They ended their season 3-11-2 and two overall and finished off with a 6-0 win against Malden, which included a hat trick by sophomore McKenna Lamont. They are they spent this year under a new coach, and it was really a positive, productive year, and they're hoping next year will also be an opportunity for growth. And on third, the same night as volleyball and soccer lost, our football team came up just short against Melrose in the D4 North semifinals. Came down to the last play, where the Hornets missed a two-point conversion on the very last play, losing 27 to 26. <coughs> um, the cheerleading team's also doing incredibly well. They won the first and second place at their two competitions and placed third at Cal's, Regionals was held last night where the Hornets once again placed third and will be moving on to states. Lastly, in cross country, girls came in fifth overall this year and had team members compete at states on Saturday. They won a really tough division but had a number of personal records beat. Sophomore Lindsay McClellan came in 11th, advancing to states. And the boys cross country team went one in 10 during the season but got stronger and placed eighth in Cal's and 18th in D4 despite being in the most competitive division in the state. At States, freshman Sam Capobianco placed 18th with the other two North Reading runners, Jake Doucette and Greg Sawyer, both running personal bests. We had a number of personal bets at that competition. And this past October, Student Council has also been very busy with their food drive. They reached their 6,000 item goal with Mr. Spinney and Mr. Dexter's Power Box winning the donation competition. Both those Power Box donated over 1,000 items each. And Student Council also held a family feud, feud event and the students were victorious against the teachers. <laughs> the NEMASC Fall Conference was held today. I was told it went very well, and camp's campaign season has begun for Duncan McNeil, the current NEMASC co-VP, who will be running for Massachusetts Student Council president this spring. Academic Decathlon will also be hosting a major competition this Saturday in North Reading High School. And for a Model UN update, as you mentioned, we said, said last meeting that both myself and Michael Tyrell, another student rep, were applying for special committee positions, and we both were accepted by Harvard. Excellent. And so we will be participating in historical agencies. Yeah. Mike will be um, Marcus Copernius Biblis in the Roman Senate. And I will be Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara in President Johnson's cabinet. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> um, and with Spirit Week coming up and Thanksgiving football game right around the corner, Powder puff practices are well underway, and Spirit Week will begin on Wednesday, and with clubs also sponsoring different activities after school, like basketball, soccer, and flag football tournaments to get everyone excited for the big game. And finally, Term 1 ended November 3rd. Report cards will be mailed tomorrow, and parent-teacher conferences will be held next Monday at 6.30. I do have a sample of student work. Um, so this is an essay that I wrote as part of my <coughs> literature class, and um, it was based on a summer reading book, Pride and Prejudice, and we were asked to write an essay about kind of how social scenes contributed to the plot and the work as a whole. So I chose to write about how it kind of contributed to a theme that pride goes before the fall. And so the rubric's attached, if you want to take a look at that. Thank you, Caitlin. Any questions for Caitlin? 
the, the only comment I would have is I believe, I, I'll screw up what it was, but I know the last time when you were here for the UN, you left before we heard that you were, what were you, in the top 0.5% oh, right. in, in the country? Oh, in the <coughs> National Merit Scholar. Oh. Yes, yes, congratulations on that. Congratulations on that. So. Yeah, that I also wanted to point out, Jerry was disappointed when he, when Jerry read the flyer about brunch with the beast, he thought we were honoring him. <laughs> <laughs> So he's not here tonight to hear the bad news that it's not about him. But anyway, anything else for Caitlin? Uh, Caitlin, I just, uh, you mentioned about Duncan McNeil and his uh, election. I just think it's nice for the committee and the public to know that it's very unusual that we would have uh, two students so close. Dan Madden, you might remember. Right, Dan was the president, year, right? Um, as the president. And D Duncan stands a very good chance of, uh, of being elected to that office. It would be quite an honor for for him, of course, but also it would be quite an honor for the high school um, to have two presidents serve um, a year apart. Excellent. Nice job, Caitlin. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank Good you job. Much. Okay. Next, we're going to move to um, thank you a presentation we have tonight for a number of community members who were involved in the huge undertaking, which was the famous little school playground, which we wanted for a long time, and which a lot of people put a lot of work, effort, and money into to get it done, and it's beautiful. And I know Miss Molly is extremely happy with it, and I know the students are happy with it, and I know the parents are happy with it. So I'm gonna let um, Chris take it from here and give us some background on the project and the people involved, and Great. hand out the certificates. Good evening, everybody. Um, we're honoring two um, different groups of people tonight but who worked very closely together and I'd like to start with the PTO Playground Committee and the Fundraising Committee who worked diligently for two years to raise money, plan, design and build a new playground at the EE Little School. Countless hours were spent on meeting with vendors, contractors and school and town employees to ensure that a new state-of-the-art and ADA compliant playground would be built on the school property. The fundraising committee raised over $100,000 in a little more than 18 months through multiple activities which ranged from bake sales to walkathons. This fundraising occurred simultaneously while other fundraising efforts were happening at the school by the PTO. So this was in addition to the regular fundraising that goes on on an annual basis. The playground committee then took on the task of planning and preparing for the weekend community build. They coordinated vol volunteer schedules, accepted deliveries, acquired the tools and machinery necessary, and ensured that everyone would have food and drink during the day. On the weekend that, that the playground was built, these fine ladies dug holes, held poles, hammered nails, assembled slides, and tightened bolts. They never lost sight of why we were building a new playground and made sure that the memory of Brianna Beninati carried on. To culminate the project, they planned a beautiful dedication ceremony that was attended by many representatives of the school community and the little school family. We are thankful for the playground and fundraising committee's hard work and dedication. On behalf of all our current and future students, we extend our sincere appreciation. So could I have the following do you want me to have them come up? Is it, could I have the following people come on up to the front? Elena DeAngelis, Linda Emery, Jennifer Vant, and Kate Schultz. Do you want to have the committee stand for a picture with you and Chris? Yeah. And the ladies? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I don't know how you want to. Mike, we might have everybody right here, if that's okay. They'll all come around. Okay. We'll do a picture. Okay. This is Elena. Elena's first. I don't want to get in the well, picture. You need a little positive press. You? I do. <laughs> Will and Angela. Linda. Oh, look at that. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Let's see if Jennifer's next. Time. No, sorry, Jennifer. Kate. Congratulations. Thank you. And Jennifer. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies. Ladies, do you want to come over here and oh, the newspaper and get a picture with the transcript? And thank you very much again. You do. And Mr. Webster's going to be in it with you. He's oh. not escaping either. Like yeah, and maybe the what other. Oh, How about right here from, from Mike? Yeah, is that okay? Mike, why don't you arrange folks the way you? Let's see. Well, come on. 
Janine, you're getting the award. We're good. We're good. I'm good. You're next. Who from the committee? It's the four women. Right, but I know you guys don't want to be in the picture? We don't need to be. You could be. No, please. No. Well, I didn't come. Are we all getting in this? You didn't come. Are we all getting in this? And now for the gentleman. Jerry loves his picture being naked. You would have been in. After nearly two years of fundraising and preparation for building a new playground, the playground committee was faced with coordinating the community build, which took place on the weekend of April 29th and 30th, 2017. In addition to an extensive list of tools that would be required, we were informed late in the process that a wide var variety of heavy machinery would be necessary to complete the project. Additionally, concrete footings needed to be poured and set prior to the build. This, of course, required multiple holes to be prepared, concrete to be mixed, and the area to be barricaded to prevent foot traffic, et cetera. We had a great turnout for the community build that weekend. Dozens of parents and staff members were present to assist. However, I think it is safe to say that if it weren't for these four dads, this project would have been impossible to complete. For weeks prior to the actual build, these dads were involved with the site preparation, the measurement and placement of concrete footings, providing and placing safety fencing around the area, the coordination of tools, equipment, and the spreading of over 150 yards or two tractor trailer loads of mulch. On the weekend that we built the structure, they acted as project managers for the project, and amazingly, the playground was complete in approximately one and a half days. The little school was in dire need of an ADA compliant, pro compliant playground, and with the help of the community and specifically these four dads, we were able to provide a safe and structurally sound play area for all children to play. So I'd like to call up Virgilio Bancarada, Chuck Mulek, Tim Brewster, and Scott Curtis could not be here tonight, but uh, we have an award for him as well. You're the little school guy, is that why you're doing this? Do we just want this like up normal, right? I mean, I know it. I like him. Playground. 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 <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also have some good news. So one of the things we're doing is um, one of the projects that's on our small capital projects this year is to is to uh, fix the area where the old playground was and to pave it and also hopefully maybe to put some more parking in and do some safe little safety things over there. There's not a lot we can do because of the traffic, et cetera, in the small area. But those are two of the projects we have before the Capital Improvement Committee this year. 
um, or for the little school. So, but thank you all again. Um, my kids went to that school. My daughter was in the first class when they reopened the school. So, um, I love the little school, and it was great to see that playground go up this year. So it's much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Okay, John, you don't want to go through all the policies before we. Uh, no, I'm only kidding. I'm I, I, only I, prom I promised Evan I would get I him out early. I kid, Evan. I kid. Okay. <laughs> Next, we have a proposal. I think Evan's been here before for the yes. North Reading High School foreign travel for spring 2019. Yes. And this year, the 2018 is China. China, right? Yep. Okay. So, Evan, the floor is yours. So this will be our um, my fifth trip, my fifth um, group going overseas. Um, and our plan is for April 2019 to go to Eastern Europe. Um, the three countries would be Hungary, Slovenia, and Croatia. And it's the itinerary. Um, so we start out in Budapest, and we spend a couple days there. Then we go to Tihani, which is also which is on the way to our next city, which is Ljubljana, which is the capital of Slovenia. Uh, we spend a couple days in Ljubljana. We go to Lake Plitvice. Pleat, I looked this up in the car. <laughs> Plitvice. Um, and that's that right there. It's one of the most beautiful nat um, natural parks uh, in the world. So very excited about that. And we leave there and we go to Split in Croatia on the Mediterranean. A um, lot of interesting cultural and historical stuff to look at um, on the trip. And this is, that's Ljubljana there. There's a big castle in the middle of the, the city. Um, the trip is insured. All students are required to buy insurance. And that's provided through EF, who we run the trip with and also MIA. Um, that covers cancellation, interruption, anything that happens on the trip would be covered if a, a kid were to get sick. It covers they lose their bag on the flight, things like that, any sort of delay. And parents also have access to um, an English-speaking representative from EF the entire time, should they need to get in touch. Um, they also have access to me, I guess. And also covers foreign workers' compensation and general liability for um, the chaperones on the trip. And as an international travel group, we have developed some goals. I shared these, uh, I think, the past two presentations. But these are sort of the main, our main goals as a group that we want the kids to be able to do. A lot of it is 21st century learning stuff and lifelong learning, getting some, some real authentic global awareness by traveling the world and stepping outside their comfort zone. I think China this year will be a good mm -hmm. take on that, for sure. Any questions for Mr. Nosey? Julie? How do the places come about? Um, I run the program with Mike Votto, math teacher. Mm -hmm. And we sit down, go through itineraries that we think would be educational, safe, and popular, basically. And we propose those to Mr. LaPrette and Mr. Bernard, and we sort of move it forward from there. You don't? ask like students where they'd we talk to them during like the the trip before and okay. see like where would you guys like to go and then um sort of fact that in for sure this is kind of um it's almost a sister or brother trip to the trip you did a couple of years ago where you were you were in prague yep. and um i it was i was there at the same time kind of trailing behind yeah, you guys <laughs> um yeah, yeah. not intentionally but uh, this is a great place not only 21st century learning but 13th century, 12th, yeah. I mean, yeah. people, kids, people get to see what ancient really is and what old really is and what some of the foundations of, mm -hmm. of our society are by traveling to these places. Because we see a house that's 200 years old here and we think, oh my, that, that's unbelievable. <laughs> you know, and you go over there and there's 1200s, 1100s, yeah. 1000s, BC, the castles. So I, I think it's great. Um, just curious. Uh, Going back to China for a second, how many students do you have signed up for that trip? We have 38, which is a full trip. We so shut it's trip closed down. now, 38? Yep. Wow, that's great. And you, is, that, is that the number you'll take on this also? Uh, the buses in Europe are a little bit bigger, so we can bring more should they decide to sign up. We brought um, 25 with us to Scandinavia last year, which is a nice number. So I think between 25 and 35 is sort of the, the ideal. 
And when you go on these trips, do you have, is there a, is there a tour guide for the whole trip or do you do? Yeah. Yeah, there is. We have a 24 hour stay with us everywhere we go tour director. That's good. And then there's local guides every city we go to. That's great. Any questions back here? So we, we talked to, to you about this before. We have this policy where we, we don't endorse the trip, yeah. <laughs> but we, we're going to approve your ability to offer the trip okay. <laughs> and also approve the staying overnight yeah. out of state. So, um, Mr. Bernard. Mr. Chairman, if it helps you, I have the motion from last year. Okay. If it helps, um, when, when the trip for China was approved. Right. And it reads, the committee voted on a motion by Mr. Webster and seconded by Ms. Imbriano to approve the North Reading, to approve the North Reading High School International Travel Club trip to China in April 2018. Okay. So I can, if somebody so does someone wants make to make that motion, that motion to I can. Certainly. Don't say China again, though. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and change the date. I'd like to make a motion to approve the North Reading High School International Travel Club trip to Eastern Europe ooh, on uh, would the eight, April, does it have the actual dates? 2019. Just so, April 2019. Yeah, okay. School vacation week, right. But Evan, is it one day that you'll miss? Yeah, we usually leave Thursday night, before, yeah. Right, so it would be the Friday before school. Uh, vacation. Okay. <coughs> we have a motion by Ms. Embriano. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, before, actually, I forgot to ask a question. You have an estimated cost for this trip? This trip is $3,400. China was more, right? Mm. China was a little bit less, but they have to pay for a visa. So oh, okay. It's about That's the same right. cost the same. We've, been, we've been approaching for the okay. past trips. And I'm assuming you'll do the, try to do some kind of, the same kind of fundraising to try yep. to offset costs as yep. much as you can. Okay. <coughs> Any further discussion? Hearing nine, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Good luck. Great. Thank you. Have a, have a fun trip to China. <clears throat> okay, now I'm, I'm all messed up on the agenda here. <laughs> I'm assuming we're going to go to Patrick next. If you don't mind. Oh, I mind, but well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick has um, both um, report cards and MCAS. MCAS, correct? Correct. All right. You might, you might want to. Bring a mic. Let's say take your mic for this. I forgot last night. Hi, Jeff. I don't know, Mike, you might be bad luck. This could be the longest school committee meeting in uh, school committee history tonight. <laughs> no, we're moving. Well, we're going pretty well, though. Yeah, yeah. you guys are doing well. Yeah. What a good clip. Oh, no way. Oh. <laughs> that, <laughs> that big enough for two years. <laughs> For those, as we wait for Patrick to get set up here, the um, scores were sent home to parents in the past few weeks, correct? They were mailed, I believe, November 2nd. And they were released a couple of weeks before that by the state. About, not, not the specific scores, but the general district they were scores. received. They were received here on October 24th and mailed on November 2nd. Okay. And received. Right. And received, yes. On the same day? No. But oh. Okay, Patrick. Phew. I'm glad you got it. <laughs> Oh, before you start, Patrick, I do want to um, promote your appearance with Mr. Bernard on uh, Inside NRPS uh, this oh, is month. Oh, it on? Oh, we, yes. We usually Thank get you. a link that, uh, oh, good. I watched it, and oh, I, I shared it on, uh, yeah, I was yeah. the one. I shared it on the Community Connection. <laughs> Excellent. So oh, good. Um, I recommend if people have a chance, you can go up to the uh, NORCAM um, page on YouTube and, and watch the interview. It's, it's uh, informative. My, my mother shared with me last night that a friend of hers who lives in Lynn saw the interview on Lynn Public Access. Ooh, so widespread, we're, we're widespread distribution. Districts. We're, oh, we're getting, uh, wow. we, got, we got fans um, all, all around. So 
<clears throat> our original presentation was scheduled for October uh, 30th, so hence the Halloween colors as well. I was all ready to go and we were ready, so um, the information, uh, as, as mentioned, has gone out, um, but I think this will be very informative. And I think, you know, uh, Superintendent and, and others um, have done a great job of communicating these changes out, so I think that the information has been communicated to parents as well, but we wanted to make sure that we informed everyone here, f you know, formally tonight. Uh, some of what's been shared already. So we're going to talk a little bit about a few things that are related. So MCAS legacy, it's a term referring to our, um, the MCAS as we've known it for the last 17 years, as well as what's called next generation MCAS, and also standards-based report cards, because I think there is a, a, an alignment here that we, that we will discuss, and I think that'll become clear through the presentation. So we're going to talk a little bit about next gen MCAS, uh, update on accountability, look at the MCAS results from 2017 for both legacy and the next generation assessment, and then talk about local assessments and standards-based report cards. So <clears throat> for the spring of 2017, uh, which is upcoming, I just want to be clear that we are, um, we, we had testing in grades four and eight on the computer. So this slide is all about computer-based testing. Um, in spring 2018, we are going to be testing on computers for grades four, five, six, seven, and eight. So we've gone one grade above what's required. Last year we just did the required grades. The middle school felt that the computer-based implementation was highly successful and logistically um, successful, and so they wanted to include sixth grade as well. Um, the test will be for English language arts, math, and we're also adding science this spring. So you're going to have the science test as well. They will still be an old MCAS legacy test, but it will be on a computer. And then in the spring of 2019, um, all grades three to eight for all tests will be on the computer, as well as grade 10 for ELA and math. Um, and then the science at the high school will follow after that. So just a few things to frame what we're going to look at here. The, um, the, the test, just one note I wanted to put in there is to ensure fairness for this year, computer-based tests and paper-based tests were equated in grades three, five, six, and seven. So it doesn't really affect North Reading, but it is interesting that that did happen this year. That's something we discussed here in presentations in the past about just the, the, the mode of testing. So that was factored in as the score. So it did affect us in terms of the way scores were set this year, even though we didn't take them on computer, but the scoring uh, was, was impacted in those grade levels. So accountability, uh, the system for accountability for this year for grades three and eight, so all our elementary schools and middle school, was determined solely on the participation rates of the students. So all of the accountability system that we've known for gap having measures where the schools are leveled, um, none of that was factored in for this year. It was basically if you had a participation rate um, that met the, the percentage of 95 or above, you receive no level. So all of our schools, as well as our district, are at no level for this year. And we will get more information about what a next generation accountability system looks like in the winter or spring of next year. So there'll be some new pieces introduced to what accountability will look like. For this year, the high school had the legacy accountability system. Um, it remains a level two school, which again, level one and two is, is where you want to be. Um, those are in the, the high green areas on the chart of the old system, and um, we will have more information. The high school will be a part of that new system next year as well. So this is a graphic that I um, borrowed from a, a colleague of mine in Tritown. Um, I thought it was a great visual to explain some of the differences here. So in our legacy MCAS system, we had these categories on the ladder, advanced, proficient, needs improvement, and warning or failing. But for the next generation MCAS, they have raised the bar in terms of the rigor of the assessment. So the ladder's a little bit higher. And the categories have also changed name, but they've also, it's not a complete crosswalk, and I think this graphic shows it well. We have exceeds expectations, meets expectations, partially meeting expectations, and not meeting expectations. And these expectations are grade level expectations. So if you are taking a fifth grade assessment, the expectations measured are fifth grade standards, even though you're receiving the, re the report the next fall. And so these arrows just show a little bit here of what you're seeing. 
the advance of the provision, if you receive those in the past, you're going to be working towards either exceeds or meeting. And if you receive proficient in the past, you're going to be at meeting or partially meeting expectations. It's not a direct crosswalk in terms of the rigor of the assessment. And you're going to see it's not a direct crosswalk across the state in terms of how the um, percentages are calculated. So you can't just go directly from needs improvement. What is now partially meeting is what used to be needs improvement. It's very different, more rigorous assessment and some changes there. So Patrick, I, I yes. just wanted to stop you there because um, I've been actually um, communicating with Tracy Novick. Um, there are a lot of websites out there that are throwing comparisons of yeah. legacy test scores to the current year scores. They can't be compared. And, yeah. and I just want parents to know if you look at, because I know in some of our schools there was an improvement, some of our schools, there, it's meaningless because they're, they're two different scales. You can't really compare it. I, I, that, I just want to put that out there. I appreciate The only that. one you can compare is the high school because yep. it's the same test, and our high school, even though it's a level two, continues <clears throat> to do extremely well mm -hmm. in the top 50 or so high schools in, in the state, Absolutely. if not better. So, right. And I'm going to highlight a few other points, but that's a point well made, Mel. Thank you. So I just want to draw attention. These are the categories again, and these are the definitions. So um, it does say there under partially meeting, if you can see that it's in red there, it says the school in consultation with the student's parent or guardian should consider whether the subject needs additional academic assistance to succeed in this subject. And so we were very clear with parents and folks, if you did receive this, what does that actually mean? And that does not automatically mean, you know, special education services are required or something like that. The red area indicates all of the available interventions and, and differentiation that we do on a daily basis. And so I'm confident that we are uh, constantly <laughs> communicating with parents about what the expectations are for students and what those needs are um, for them if they are to score in this area. And I think, as always, and we've done a great job framing this in our community, this is one data point from a few days of testing. It's, it's an important data point. It gives us great information. It holds our schools accountable. It holds our curriculum accountable. But it's one data point, and we have many data points throughout the year. This is just a quick glimpse of what the report looks like now. It's very different. It's going to be, it will be color-coded just like this. The arrow would indicate at the top where the score is. The scores are not rounded to even numbers, so you might have an odd number like 541. And at the bottom, you'll see your child's score, the school score, how they scored against the district, and how they scored against the state. The individual reports, and I will say this is from a Department of Ed report, these numbers don't add up. So if anyone wants to, they just pulled together some examples of what a page would look like. But it will show you on the different categories, such as this is mathematics, you've got measurement and data, geometry, numbers, and operation and fraction. It will show you how many questions in those categories um, are available. Something that's very exciting for our teachers is they are providing many more questions available than they have in the past few years. In the past few years, it would be frustrating because you'd see 10 of your students scored number 11 wrong, and you click on number 11 to see what that question was, and it would say this, this question is not available. So now either you're going to have the question to see exactly where they didn't score well, or there's going to be a description of what type of question it is. So you know exactly, and it will be more specific than this was a measurement and data question. It will be very specific about what standard was being assessed and the type of question so that they can practice and, and look at that for an area of improvement. So this, uh, this slide and the, and the slide after speak to what um, Mr. Webster was saying before, um, that the standards are more rigorous that you really cannot, that last bullet there, the spring 2015 is a baseline year. I think everything you're going to see here today is that we have established in this state a baseline. All of the school accountability systems are reset to no level. And when I show you the graphics of how the scores look across the state, there's no other way to look at it than this is a complete reset of the system. And it should not be compared to previous year's scores. And it's going to take us a few years before we can even start to really draw some, some conclusions from the trends and the patterns that we're seeing emerge. This is what M MCAS cut scores look like in the past. There's a lot of reasons for this. Um, th so this graph shows at the bottom is ELA, all the way from grades 3 to 10, then it's math, then it's science, technology, engineering. You can see, and we've seen this through our presentations here, that students would um, have a high level of um, 
achievement in grade three and then it might go down in grade four and then back up in five and down in eight and back and we always got to the place we wanted to in grade ten you can see how those scores there these very different shapes some of this had to do with the test not being aligned to one another some of that had to do with the fact that all of these tests were not introduced and in, in, at the same time we came out with certain tests for certain years and then they introduced more tests at more years as the system developed here's what the assessment looks like now <coughs> very clean very straight line everything above the fifty percent mark is either meeting expectations or exceeding expectations everything below is partially meeting or not meeting so you know in some ways it's very interesting that you give this test to all the students in our state and this cut scores are determined and they it falls just like this it's very very clean I think everyone would agree but it gives you there's no way around the fact that it gives you a tremendous baseline now it's everyone's at the same starting point half the state is above it half the state is below and from here we measure our progress against this baseline it does align very much with what we do see on a national level for the NAEP assessments and you'll see that 50 percent of this essentially 50 percent above this line and 50 percent below okay so it's go ahead, the NAEP scores. yep where have we kind of placed because <coughs> rumor has it that our scores have gone down that we haven't been as high as we have been in the past as the, far as the state of Massachusetts for the state of Massachusetts we're, we're still we're still uh, number one in the nation the last the, the individual scores, scores. Massachusetts they took Massachusetts out and treated it as if it was its own country right and we were third in the world now I do think that scores however did go down a percentage or two um, in both math and and English but we were still ranked if you took us as a country we would be third in the world correct and still number one in the country right. so I mean the the individual scores might be trending in different ways but that's that's what's happening we don't, we don't get local scores <clears throat> we don't get the scores. no no I th we don't get local scores no no I believe she was asking Massachusetts no yes I was yeah. just making a point but uh, you were talking about as a state yeah. but we have participated in the last two rounds do we do we participate every year every time they're given it's by invitation yeah, when it's yeah. offered yeah. and I I only recall it being the last two cycles you did grade four Patrick one other question I had on results when you look at 50 percent of the state below 50 percent above and and I know the state would probably never do this but do they ever take a look at what percentage of those below are urban districts and what you know what kind of mm -hmm. assists Democrat. and what kind of you know what we can do because it it seems like that's obvious that's obviously where you know urban and poor rural districts are, are usually where your biggest issues are right mm -hmm. and and it seems like I don't know what the state does in terms of trying to pull that out and say how do we how do we fix this you know what it, or what is the fix sure well I think that would be their accountability system and so they identify that the districts that have more students in the red and, and the colors are, are incorrect on this and I uh, it, this is a state slide um, but the bottom two levels there, um, those are your schools that are in districts that are going to drive your accountability system to get more assistance and to, and to have more needs. So I will say, and I'll keep going back to this, we always say in this district we don't really um, compare ourselves to the state average because North Reading traditionally achieves above the state average and we want to compare ourselves more to like districts. Um, so we do look to places where we've exceeded the state average. However, I will say in order to get this slide where it is and to have the cut scores 50 50 like this you're going to see more uh, students in that need expectation than we ever saw in needs improvement um, I'm sorry not meeting expectation so, or, or partially meeting expectation so when I show you the sides of the district results I think when we see that we're above the state average it means even more than it ever has in the past if that makes sense Okay, and I think I've, I've touched on some of these different things. It is important for the state to communicate out that, you know, these standards were set and the cuts were set by panelists that consisted and they brought in experts, including educators, into those discussions as well. So I have an overview now of just the grade levels, the subjects in grades three through eight. I'm just going to go through. What I've shown you here are the percentages for exceeding meeting expectations 
On the left-hand side for all of these slides are um, North Reading scores, and on the right-hand side are our state scores. And just some of the highlights for grade three reading, 65% of our students are meeting or exceeding expectations. Grade three math, 71% meeting or exceeding expectations. Grade four ELA, 69%. Grade four math, 64%. Grade five ELA, 61%. Grade five math, 56%. Grade six ELA, 58%. Grade six math, 67%. Grade seven, 57% for ELA. Grade seven math is 65%. Grade eight ELA is 57%. Grade eight math is 57%. On the science for grades five and eight, elementary is well above the state average. I'll draw attention to this again in a few moments, but we're, we're well above the state average is 73% proficient or higher versus 46. For grade eight, we made significant improvements. We are above the state average in several areas, and we have more students in advanced um, than we, in proficient than we have had in the past. For grade 10, so this is our legacy scores, 98% of the students in English language arts, 95% in mathematics, 93% advanced or proficient in science. It's the lowest percentage of needs improvement and failure in four years for math and science in our schools um, at the high school. And especially, I mean, no knock against ELA, but our math and science scores are well above the state average. To go from 79% for the state and 95% in the school is, uh, says quite a bit about our, our program here, as well as our science scores at 93% versus 74% for the state. You can't really beat 98% for ELA, um, but the state average there is 91%. So again, our highlights, I'm really drawing the high school mathematics. I think overall, when you look at what we've done, in that program with all of the changes that we've gone through in the last several years with our courses and our programs I think that our high performance really speaks to the the work that our teachers have done in our curriculum redesign and our um, program adoption we have 91 percent at one of our schools the Batchelder School for for fifth grade science I, I want to draw attention to that that is an unbelievable number I believe it's the highest number in the state um, to have that, that number of advanced proficient um, is, is commendable. There are eight areas of concern that we noted. Um, so anywhere that we're below or at the state average, we, we identified as areas of concern because, as I mentioned before, uh, traditionally we are, are well above the state average. So those are the areas that we looked at. Um, and we're meeting at each school. This is something that the superintendent and I uh, started last year. Uh, we feel that it's been very successful. We have deep conversations with each principal, um, and those principals have, have often already had their conversations with their curriculum leaders or assistant principals in the building. And we found that that's a great place to go deep. And, and you know, we, we've uncovered things even, we had two meetings today at two different schools, and some of our um, <clears throat> investigations of why those scores were, were where, they, where they are uh, led to some analysis on our part, but also some questions that we have for the Department of Education about the way they're processing the scores. We also look at our comparison districts because it's one thing to compare yourself to the state, but the, the DART comparison schools help you look at schools that are similar to yours. And so looking at where we are, um, I'm not saying it's an area of concern when we look at our DART comparison districts, but it, it helps us to not be complacent. It helps us to say, when compared against our peers, how are we doing in comparison? Do you, do you have the list of the latest? I, I know sometimes the DART districts change. Yes. Do you have the list of who are we, who are we compared with now? Sure. So it, it, it varies by school. So each school has their own set of schools that they're oh, comparable okay. to. And then the district has its own set. But essentially, um, for example, I was saying today, the hood and the little compare to one another. Neither compares to the batch, just the way they're set up mm -hmm. demographically. Um, <coughs> but I, I know as a district, some of the comparison schools would include Reading. They would include Hanover, uh, Longmeadow. Um, 
Groton Dunstable. So I, I could provide you with that list, but it's also on our, if you go to the school accountability website uh, on, our, on our district page under quick links, you go to the report card, I can show you that in a moment. But um, all of the comparison schools are listed there and that, that information is updated. That's, have, on, that's on our page, can, on the North Reading. You can read them off right now if you want. Yeah, but that, that's for the that's for the district. That's for the district. So I, I I think it's important to make sure you're comparing the school ones to the school ones, and not. So the you district. you can go to that page though, and yeah. it's yep. on your. I can show you. It's is if it, you. Oh, it's attached to that. I'll show you right now. If you go to the school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a fast network we have here. So under the quick links, the district and school report cards. Um, oh, so that's a, it's the DESE. If you go, if you go to the DART, it's going to show you our okay. our schools. Okay. Now, some of this it, for different schools or for different areas, it's not quite updated yet for 17. Right. So that's important too. But you can look at the comparisons from last year's. This data might be from last year, but you can then go to those individual schools here and look them up. So that's what I did when I did my comparisons. Yeah. I went to like the middle school. You can then switch school and, and click over to middle see who our dark districts are for the middle school. Oh. It's just taking a moment here to load. But once you have that list of schools, you can then go to each of those schools and get their current data. And that's what we did. So unfortunately, it's not all here yet. No, they haven't updated the website. I don't right, know but the dist if we yeah. use last year's districts and then go to those schools to get this year's scores, that, that's worked for us as well. So that's just an example of the of the comparison schools for um, for that for that school. Okay, I'm going to go to the uh, back <laughs> benchers first. Any questions on MCAS uh, from you two, Janine and Scott? No, not so much. But uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the coming years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Julie. Anything? Nothing. You know, the only question I have and. People will be surprised I'm asking this, but I, I always wonder, I often wonder why um, they have to, or we have to give the tests in basically every grade from third grade up. And yep. is there ever been thought of, you know, third, fifth, eighth, fourth, sixth, eighth, or has that ever been given consideration? It's been brought up. Um, I know I've asked that question. I think in a certain high achieving district, if you, if That's you exactly get to a certain from. point, is it needed? But I don't think anyone's willing to go there yet. And I think the idea is, again, it, a lot of accountability exists because we can't let certain kids or certain subgroups fall through the cracks. So even if we're high achieving, we still have our own gaps in North Reading. We still have kids that are being identified. I mean, we have conversations today. We're looking at individual students who deserve our radar every year. But I, guess I think that's, that's what the argument would be on both sides of, um, of the pol political spectrum. But the major problem I've had with this from day one is the one size fits all mentality. Mm -hmm. And I, I know what you're saying about we have kids in our district who are gonna need extra, I understand all that. Yeah. But as a, as a high performing district, it's my opinion, we're going to recognize that anyway. Mm -hmm. And kids aren't gonna fall through the cracks because of the kind of district that we are. Right. And, and I just, you know, I, I always say maybe someday the state will say, look, we know we have to treat all districts equally, but there are high performing districts that are doing things really well and we should let them yeah. have a little more leeway. It's yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I also have heard the argument though, I mean, you need all the data to compare them to because otherwise you're only gonna be compared, you know, it's not gonna be the standard for all seventh graders across the state. It's only going to be certain sure. seventh graders. So having that data, yeah, and you can that. see that through what, what's happened the last few years with all the different tests and all the different modes, they don't have enough data to draw the samples that they need to come up with um, the information. So I don't see it changing anytime soon um, from that. Again, I think our, our goal here is to keep it in perspective. We, we, we teach to the standards. The, the assessments are aligned to the standards. It gives us valuable information but it doesn't drive everything we do. And I think this year, as I've said, the last few years especially, I think other forms of assessment, local assessments, other um, assessments that we've developed or have, have uh, brought into our district give us just as meaningful information as, as what we're getting here. 
and it keeps, I think we've done a good job in this community to keep that in perspective. One last thing, have you seen anything at the federal level that, um, I mean, we've seen and heard things, but actually seen any policy come down or communications that will result in changes in the next year or two? For assessments? Yeah. I, I have not. I mean, with the, with the reauthorized ESSA, I think there were some yeah, um, the place. pieces yeah. that are certainly <clears throat> affecting our accountability system and some others, but I, I think, um, you know, not, not in a major way that we've been talking about tonight. I think there's small changes here and there um, that have affected things, everything from the alternative assessment to, um, to what's happening here, but I, I don't see major changes coming to this. No. Julie? So we see the changes that the state has implemented over the past, I would say, five or six years at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, as our curriculum <coughs> leader, have you been able to look at those results, which, in my opinion, you really can't compare year to year because formats have changed, curriculum has changed. Um, what have we been able to do as a district to kind of go through and digest those changes and make you know, the, the improvements with curriculum for our students. What have you been able to do, sure. given those insane amount of changes? Yeah, there's been, there's a lot of variables, and uh, we were talking about this today at one of our schools. There's, there's just a lot of variables, and it's very difficult to make any conclusion based on one year of data. And if we're not allowed to compare to last year, what we, what we start with today is look at it and say, this is an area of concern, let's keep an eye on it. Let's try to figure out what's happening here. Um, but it's not a cause for alarm, and it's something, if you see it over three years, then, then that becomes a, a cause for concern. Um, I would say what, what has helped us, no matter what, it's helped us to understand the new standards better, because the questions are more aligned to the new standards, and I think our teachers are seeing, oh, in order for a student to answer this question correctly, they really need to get at the whole standard and the verbs are different in the standards, and the expectations are different. What's being asked of students in terms of writing, in terms of reading closely, in terms of using data to answer questions and to go back and get evidence in all aspects and all subjects. The, the test has really made that clear, um, and, and it's, I've heard teachers saying very often that they're able to better understand now that standard that they were teaching. The teachers have also really compliment, especially our Eureka Math program, um, about being fully aligned. They, it really is clicking for them as they're looking at the assessment questions now, as they're looking at the results, and as they're um, doing a breakdown of the, the shifts in our new, because our ELA and our math frameworks were recently updated, seeing how well aligned that program is. Um, and I'm, I'm hearing that, especially at the elementary level with the mathematics. And a third um, point, I felt personally when we had grade level tests that were aligned to the subject area, I feel like we got tremendous results. That's something we've now gone away with. Um, Park had that, this does not at this time. But when we were able to see eighth graders actually take an algebra one test, um, and we really saw how well they did on the standards they were actually taught that year, I think that was pretty powerful and that was important. And that's something I've I'm involved in a group right now talking about what's happening next for math and for math pathways because <coughs> something we're looking at at the eighth grade here is how many students scored advanced or exceeding expectations, I'm sorry, on the eighth grade test. Remember, those students took Algebra 1 plus a little bit of eighth grade, but then took an eighth grade test. So they didn't actually take the test on the subject they just completed. And I really want to look at that data over the next few years and help to see how well it's helping us, or if it's helping us at all, to, to measure our curriculum and what they're being taught because the, the state assessment isn't even aligned with what they were just taught. It's something that I feel is a little incongruous at this time. So there's a lot there, but as I mentioned before, in this time of transition, we've been looking at a lot of other assessments as well um, to give us that information because it is, it is difficult to say this is going to give us the information. And we were just barely after about 15 years of MCAS, getting to a point where we were all comfortable receiving that data and turning around and saying, oh, this really reflects what I've done the last five years. Mm -hmm. It's going to take us still a couple years, but I feel like we are finally getting over this hump, and I I'm hope I'm back here in two or three years saying, this is my first year now doing a three-year analysis, and here's what we see. I'm looking forward to that uh, presentation in a couple of 
<laughs> and hopefully nothing else changes. And I just wish my <laughs> kids were either younger or older and their education yeah. was not, you know, at play here. It's, you know what, though, I, I, I agree with you and I understand, but we all went through school. Something happened to all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it was, the, maybe they were here to benefit from the building and they weren't here when they were disrupted. Or I, I was in school before the Internet. You know, like everyone has something that wasn't ideal. You have to at some point make a shift and it's been a little bumpy, but... We're, I feel like we're getting through it now onto this new, you know, once it's all on computers, once it's next generation, I think we are going to be in a better place. So hopefully we're there. Jerry was in school when they invented electricity. <laughs> I, can, I can do that tonight because he's not here. <laughs> Just very quickly, to, to align with this discussion, um, standards-based report cards at the elementary level and at all of our levels I want to talk about. This is a quote. I'm just going to read it to you. Um, a single letter grade or percentage score is not a good way to report student achievement in any subject area because it simply cannot present the level of detailed feedback necessary for effective learning. This is from Robert Marzano in a book about transforming how we assess our students. This is not to say that what we're doing is failing by giving letter grades and obviously colleges are still looking for letter grades and all of those things and, and percentages are calculated. But what this does speak to is the importance of communication through standards-based. We are a standards-based um, school. We are, we've been following our standards since 1993 when ed reform came out, when the standards came into place at the, at the turn of the century um, as they were developed. We, we, at all grade levels, are, are communicating to students and to parents through rubrics and through information about how they're progressing against the standards. But at the elementary school, we have a standards-based report card. Um, <coughs> In the past, since 2011, we've had new standards in English language arts and mathematics, and we knew that those were going, undergoing revision. They've just come out again this year. And so we do need to update our report cards to make sure they fully align with what is being taught and what students are expected to know and be able to do at those grade levels. We also want to think about how we can incorporate possibly some other aspects of what we're educating the whole child with social emotional learning and some of those skills that are also important for students to develop. We have the practices in both math and science. And we also want to think about what standards-based report cards or reporting would look like at the secondary level. So where we are in our process is we're gathering information from teachers, parents, and students, and also other districts this year. We're going to form a small working group to meet throughout the 17-18 year, design and build our assessment, and pilot something in the fall of 18-19. So our plan is to have an updated report card that would go um, out for next year. But I want to be clear that we realize from the get-go that we're not going to get this right the very first time through. And, and I've been working with a lot of districts, and it's taken multiple years to go through this. So we're going to repeat this pilot with slight variations over the next few school years. Hopefully, after th about three years of these new report cards, we'll have something that we're in agreement on. Not saying it's going to change, it's not going to have a different report card every year. That's not what I'm saying. But we will have um, a pilot process as we're uh, trying to arrive at what we believe to be the, the ideal um, report card that represents what students should know and be able to do at elementary school. So we're looking at many things here. We're looking at the content themselves, so what we're calling the power standards, what the most important aspects of the standards are, and putting that into parent-friendly language. We want to make sure that they're aligned to the frameworks. And we're also thinking about alignment with MCAS and other reports. And so even the, you know, the reporting categories, that's up for consideration. You know, do we do one, two, three, four, or do we have the same language of exceeding, meeting, not meeting? Because you should see some kind of alignment. It would be very strange to have MCAS scores be one way and student report cards be completely different in content. Uh, they should be somewhat aligned. We, as I mentioned, the social emotional learning and the practice standards are areas that we'd like to see. Do they fit into our report cards? And I think part of what we're looking at is you want it to be comprehensive but not exhaustive. Um, and we've seen some report cards that are exhaustive. <laughs> Patrick, how, would you, how do you envision a report card on, you know, a report on social emotional learning skills? What, what kind of things do you envision that covering? Sure. So we have a, a process that we're beginning to explore with social emotional. And for example, a lot of the skills that might be valued um, 
might come through group work, cooperation, so things, it's some of what we think of as some of those 21st century skills as well, collaboration, cooperation, um, showing effort. So, and some of it overlaps with the math practices. So it might be an opportunity there to, to provide explicit feedback about how students are doing in those areas. Um, whether it's a separate social emotional piece of the report card or whether it's incorporated into the content areas, those are things that we would discuss. So we would have, um, and we've seen, there, there's several examples of how districts have been doing this that we would look to um, as sort of a, as a best practice. We're also very concerned with the idea of calibration and scoring. So how do you assess students and how do you calibrate this across the district? This is the time to have this conversation to make sure that um, when a teacher looks at a student and gives a student a certain uh, score at the end of the first trimester that everyone's looking at it the same. So one conversation that we need to have district-wide is if this is a year-long standard and the student is exactly where she needs to be at the end of the first trimester, is that a two or is that a four? Mm -hmm. So if you're giving them exceeding at the beginning of the year on a year-long standard, are you basically saying they've already exceeded the year-long standard or are you saying they're exactly where they need to be for this point in the year? And that's an important piece that a lot of districts have had deep conversations about, and we're going to bring that conversation here to make sure we're in calibration and alignment. Um, we also have technology tools to consider. So we have, through our new system this year, um, a new portal to communicate with parents. It's not something that's rolling out just yet, but as we update our report cards, we could begin to share more um, progress updates with parents at the elementary level the way we do at the secondary level. So those are things we're going to be talking about and also obviously just the training on how to use and just the simple idea of how to enter information into the new tools. So we are looking at the pilot years as identified there for the elementary school. The middle school is going to be watching very closely because middle school is um, in a place where they are seriously thinking about shifting to standards based. So I've, I've given them a little bit more time to be thinking about this but we're you know, this, this obviously is subject to, to, uh, to change, but at this time we're thinking about, you know, five years out, uh, looking at the middle school pilot, and then high school, again, a few more years out. But to begin, just to begin thinking about if we were to switch to a standards-based reporting system, what that would look like. Obviously, we'd still need to find a way for colleges and everything for these standards-based grades to translate into um, percentages that would work and compute with, with what colleges are looking at. From all reports from our uh, guidance office, colleges are still looking for traditional grades, um, but many schools have come up with a way to do both. Because I think we all agree philosophically <coughs> that the most important way, as I started with that quote, for a student to actually see room for improvement is to be able to identify exactly, if you just say to a student you're getting a B minus, that doesn't show you how to improve. But if you're told this is an area of weakness and this is what you need, need to do to improve and it's really tied into the learning standards, there's more opportunities for growth. So we see this as a potential um, for, for all of our students at all of our schools. And we're going to be having this philosophical conversation K-12 to with a real focus at elementary, followed by middle, followed by high school. Any questions on the report cards? Yes. Yeah. I, I have one. So <clears throat> on the, the last the last slide before this one yes so Julie made a good point saying <clears throat> well you know some kids are going to be the pilot my big concern here is it seems like that if this happens the exact same kids are going to be the pilot in each one and we just said you know we we're not going to get it right the first time so if, if the older elementary students are the pilot in 2018 to 2020 then they're going to be the pilot in the middle school and then they're going to be the pi pilot in the high school and that's really concerning to me that if, if we're going to be changing and we specifically just say we know we're not going to get it right right away that it's the same students that are going to be the pilots for each each grading system i mean and again this is for the report cards versus you know a state testing assessing the child and that's very concerning to me good point mm -hmm. i i don't think that it would be the same students though i think we would when we get to that point maybe we'd start with eighth grade pilot in eighth grade and then change it for those, so by the time the sixth graders get to eighth grade, it wouldn't be the first year of the pilot. Um, and it, it's not necessarily that it's a three-year pilot window necessarily, it's more, you know, we'll structure it in different ways. Um, in some ways, middle school wants to start a little bit earlier than this too. So some of the early 
trials and, and, and pieces might start a little bit earlier, but we will certainly keep that in mind so it's not the same exact cohort of students always having uh, a new report card every year. You know, we don't, we don't want to have that either. Um, and, and a lot of this shift is not just the report card that I, I should have said this earlier. The report card is honestly, it's the least important part of the standards based shift. It's really a shift in instruction. It's a shift in the teachers that have been through this process have said, and I, we had some great teachers from other districts presenting saying how it's you know, revolutionized their instruction because they're really realizing now it's not about um, trying to spend all their time figuring out what the grade calculates to. It's about trying to show through a portfolio of evidence where the student is. And it's a major shift in terms of it's not an average of where you are, it's where you get to at the end. That's the real shift with standards based that if you score low, low, high, 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 it's not an average of those scores. It's where you are now, where you are most consistently. Because that's our goal. Our goal is to get them to a certain point. And so th it's, th it's that philosophical discussion that would take place during these three years, not necessarily the report card shifts themselves. So what is the trend on the state level for shifting with this sort of evaluation tool? And, and what, do you, what do you mean by that? Like, like a, a statewide report that card? I you've looked at other districts who are either there or in the process of getting there, mm -hmm. but is there a trend statewide for districts to do this, you know, the, more of this performance, um, I guess, continuum standard-based assessment? Um, I, I mean, in, in conversationally, through all my colleagues, this has been a very hot topic. We, we did a presentation last month. We had uh, groups present. <coughs> We're seeing more and more middle, I think the, the big shift of elementary switching to this was the last 10 or 15 years. Now the huge, everyone's talking about middle school, um, and some are starting to talk about high school. And a lot, of, a lot of districts, I'm hearing a lot more middle school. I haven't heard one person say we're switching back to you know, grades or letters in the elementary school. But I, I um, think it's, it's, it's more grassroots, wouldn't you say? There's no, there's no directives coming out. Right. There's, there's not. It's, right. it's, more, no. it's more grassroots. And I think this is something that our, would you agree, Patrick, our elementary teachers are very excited about this. I mean, this is, this is something they've been absolutely the updates and just for. the report cards. I in mean, I, I did hear you say portfolio based, mm -hmm. and I think that philosophically is a huge change. And if that's something that we are thinking of at the elementary level, then I think educating parents um, is huge. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I wouldn't say it's a huge shift. I mean, what I mean by the portfolio, meaning that in order, you know, you have a standard and you have a, a series of lessons or assignments or assessments in that standard. So it's that portfolio of work sure. that you're then arriving at a, a standards-based grade. I think that's not a change. That, what my question that. is, I've seen portfolio-based asse um, assessments, evaluations, and you wouldn't necessarily be getting a printed report card, you know, every, you know, term or semester, you would be looking, you would ha be having parents be looking at portfolios. <clears throat> if, if that's what I'm thinking, is yeah. that what you're proposing or? I, I don't quite think that's what it is, but I think behind those right. grades, okay. you'd still have a report card, but behind those grades would be More, a portfolio of work, which, which there is now. If you, right. if you were to come into the classroom now and say, I'd like to see where that's coming from, you, that's what you'd see. And you wouldn't just see, here's a bunch of tests on different subjects and different right. standards. You'd see it based upon certain standards. And that's really what I meant by portfolio. Um, As opposed to like a capstone project is what sometimes a portfolio sure. means that. Well, I, sure. that, that's not what we're talking about. I, I'd like to see the state take a look at portfolio evaluations for yeah. high school graduation, yeah. personally. I mean, MCAS tests can still be there, but I think I that, that takes more of the whole student into account than just MCAS. Yeah. I think results. you're going to see some interesting developments with that. I think you're getting that push. You're also, there's still conversation about more testing in subject areas and in grades 11 and 12. So there's but more. I believe there's districts in New Hampshire that are, <coughs> you know, kind of removing themselves from the traditional um, statewide assessments that, you know, the federal government are mandating in going toward that portfolio route. Yeah. They're actually re not even, they're kind of doing their own, you know, kind of grassroots kind of assessment. And right. They're doing that exactly. 
And I think, again, we're not proposing that here, but I think the work that we're going to do, it would be easy to transition to something like that because the foundation would be there. Right. And what, what I'm hearing from other districts, another district mentioned this, the first cohort of students who is getting to middle school, who's had this now K through six or seven, all of a sudden the teachers that are giving traditional grades, they're, they're up against something they've never had before. The parents are coming up and saying, well, tell me where that grade came from. And it's not just show me all the scores, it's show me the portfolio of evidence. You know? And that's, that's a major shift at those levels um, that I think uh, this work would prepare us for. So I think it's, a, as I mentioned before, it's a shift in really the way you're instructing, the way you're thinking about assessment. Um, which I think is pretty interesting. And you know, you know what else it does? It gives, um, it should give people a better appreciation for what teachers do. Instead of just giving a letter grade, the teacher <coughs> kind of show all the different kinds of lessons they've gone through. And I mean, I think it, it, it's a better reflection on the work that teachers put in to hopefully get, hopefully get the students to achieve rather than Absolutely. just a letter grade. It, it, because it, it, there's a lot more thought, you know, that, that, has to be put into it. Not that they don't put thought into it now, but you have to be yes. clear yep. with it does. And what, it you're, what you're talking about in terms of the performance. It provides a lot more opportunity for students as well because right. the, the system with zeros, can you, you can fall into a hole you can never get out of as a, as a student, whereas with a system of, um, uh, with the shift in, in, in this can really give students that are lower achieving more opportunities um, to achieve, but that's a we could do a grad course on yeah. on that stuff. Learning but I think style. I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity here, and again, it's those philosophical conversations that we're going to have district wide. Um, so the headline is not high school to switch to standards based reporting, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's a long term uh, shift. But the elementary school is absolutely, and as John mentioned, very excited about updating their report cards to. Uh, to adjust to the new standards. There was, there was a reaction at the opening day meeting. Oh, yeah. I remember <laughs> it was identified. That I think it was, was a sigh like, of yeah, it really thanks. Was, they were, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Any other questions for Patrick on the report cards? I, I just, while we have you here, before you leave, and I know both of you are, you know, both of you up to your um, eyeballs and research and information on this, but the, the school start times is taking on, uh, every day there's another district looking at it. And I know that Mr. Bernard, you know, spearheaded an effort to try to get Cape Ann League superintendents uh, meeting and <coughs> met with some approval, but we, we met we met a few times last year, and I think it's fair to say that <clears throat> in our region among the Cape Ann League, I think Maskinomit is probably the first right. They're one. they're closest to yeah. And they've got a great their school. They they do a great job on social media, and they they have a great they put together a great study, forty page study on it, and using a lot of the existing studies that uh, a forty page report, I should say. Um, I do. I, I would be shocked if within the next 10 years it's not mandated that school times change. I'll be shocked if the state um, doesn't weigh in on that. We'll, we'll see. But uh, there's just so much evidence that says we should be starting school later there um, is. for high school kids. It, as, I, as I mentioned here before, we did a lot of research. We're prepared. I live in that district of Maskinama, and so I've been privy to all that they've done. I've attended a lot of meetings there. Um, there's not been the amount of interest here from folks sort of demanding it no. um, that we've heard. I, I believe I had two folks respond to me with interest. Uh, when I went to Maskinomit, you've got hundreds of parents that are lining up to demand the shifts. And not many of them are elementary, and I think elementary is now just finally understanding the impact on them. So there's, <laughs> there's still a lot of communication and information that has to go even as far along as they are. Um, but. I think uh, you know we, we've we've laid a lot of groundwork for research on that in this district, but there's not been um, the real interest in the shifts. And I think part of that is that there's a lot of things that need to change, and a lot of that has impacts in a lot of areas. Um, so our league didn't have a commitment from all the districts to make changes. Um, those things shouldn't tie your hands, you know. But they are logistical things that do need to be worked out and considered first. And uh, if there is a, a, a huge interest in a, in a charge of that, we can pick up where we are to continue that conversation. But at this time, we are looking at, we're still looking at many other ways to reduce stress, to give kids more opportunities for getting the sleep that they need. Um, and I think we're taking a lot of proactive steps this year in many different ways without changing the start time. I think there's many other things that also need to shift and change, and we're working on those 
as we're in the background, still keeping a very close eye to what's happening in these other districts, as I know you are as well. There was some interest, and I actually pointed um, people to the Maskinomit um, yeah. social uh, media page, Facebook page. I also pointed them. There's a national um, group website with all kinds of information. They, they may come around at some point. Um, I did hear, is this rumor true that um, one of the new courses AJ will be asking to introduce is a, a sleeping block? next year <laughs> will require no instructors so we won't have to add to the budget <laughs> it's a good idea that, that might be a good idea right it's One not a bad idea nap time something like that that is not true mike <laughs> I w- <laughs> you get that. i would say although just, to pa- patrick's yeah. point about helping students to on a serious note uh to deal where we, where we may not be adjusting is we are doing something new in the power block at the high school called mm-hmm. power down yep kind mm. of a, a relaxation um uh, social emotional learning kind of Med- I don't want to call it meditation, but uh, mindfulness. 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 Sure. Yeah. Michael and I, uh, excuse me, Patrick and I are participating in a uh, series of mindfulness sessions. That Michael's our, coming tomorrow. Our, yeah, we've been trying to get Michael to come. We, <laughs> we think he might be, a, you might be free tomorrow. Right? It's actually. It's actually very good. Very, it's, very it's good. A, it's a faculty and student uh, participant uh, body, which is really, yeah. it's been a lot that of. That alone is been really good. Yeah. If it's going to have an impact on Michael's work rate, yeah. we don't want him going. <laughs> only be, it would only be positive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I, I would say even the, the, the screenager's presentation, because that right. gets into a whole piece about True. even if they are going to bed, if they're going to bed looking at a blue light yep. for 45 minutes before bed, you're not getting proper sleep. So I think we're doing these little pieces to address sleep without that major shift happening, but it's still, we're on it in the background as well. Okay. Anything else for Patrick while we have him? Have him to grill? No? Okay, great. Thank Thanks, you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, where are we? I think we're back to, we're at the beginning. Tonight's meeting. And Mel still has time for the, uh, for the start time. For the what? Oh yeah, I still have time for the start time. You got oh, wait, the bathroom, you got a little really? bit longer. Yeah, your legacy. Okay, so we gotta get Mr. Bernard back here because our next. I'm ready. Our next uh, update is the MSBA. MSBA SS School Secondary School Building Committee update. Yes, sir. So, uh, hot off the press, I am told that the installation of the glass that we are seeking to have replaced in the uh, uh, sneeze guard at the high school cafeteria is due to be replaced tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. So, <laughs> wow, maybe just just like in time for our SSBC. It was supposed to be this morning. But when I did my report to you on Friday, or Thursday, excuse me, last week, I, I'm glad I wrote that the week of November 13th, because it was scheduled for this morning, but it got bumped to tomorrow morning. And there is an SSVC <clears throat> meeting tomorrow, correct? There is. There's a principal's meeting at 4.30, regular meeting at 4.30. And do, well, it'll be interesting to see if we have everything we need to pay the final invoice I have, to I have, Gilbane. I have no information on that. As of Thursday, there's, it's not. Okay. Well, tomorrow should be interesting, then. Um, anything else? No, sir. Okay. School is still here. Um, still. You're talking about from the storm? No, the school is still here. I'm oh, just, the school is still here. School is here. still here, yes, looking yeah. good, serving its purpose. <laughs> we did have, you know, we had a chance to show it off a couple of times in the past week. We had uh, professional development with teachers from other districts here. We did. On Tuesday, and we had the, yeah. um, we had the Hornet Holiday, Hornet Productions Holiday Fair. Friends, Friends of Hornet Productions Holiday Marketplace. Yes. Right. So we had a great chance to, to show the school off. I'm glad you brought that up because the end pen day on November 7th, that's the uh, Northeast Professional Educators Network, the, the professional development that we were one of the host sites on, uh, on that Tuesday. And there were um, people from, mm, I'd say about, probably two, di- two dozen districts, a lot of paraprofessionals, ELL teachers, BCBAs, and it was very nice to um, to see and hear the reaction to people coming into this building that had never been here before. Yeah. There were quite a few folks from Saugus who, as you all know, recently passed uh, a project. So they were kind of excited too to, to see some spaces and, 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 and tour the school a little bit. And I was able to do that for them. But um, yeah, it, it really, it, it's, it's pretty impressive. And I think what, what's really cool about it is it's year four for, for this school, year three right. for the middle school, and it still feels new. Yeah. It still has. Yeah, it still has a wow to it. it. It does, and it's still continuing to add value, more value on a regular basis to our education process I here. Couldn't agree more. So, okay, next we have a slew 
of policies to approve for second reading, which should be very quick. And I will ask the policy <coughs> committee to uh, make the motions and seconds, and then we can go through and because there shouldn't be any questions because it's second reading on all these. No, I think we'll go very quickly if that's right. okay. Um, in terms of form, is it just move for acceptance of a second reading? Yeah, move for second. Yeah, move for acceptance second reading of the policy. Yeah. Okay. So I move for acceptance of a second reading of policy ABB entitled School Committee Powers and Duties in the section School District Organization. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, unanimous. I move for acceptance of a second reading of policy ABCB entitled School Committee Member Qualification slash Oath of Office within the section School District Organization. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I move for acceptance. Yes. Move for acceptance of a second reading of policy BBBB entitled New School Committee Member Orientation uh, under Section School Committee Operations. Second. For the discussion, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I should say 4-0, four, four not unanimous. 4-0. <coughs> Next. Yep. I move for acceptance of a second reading policy BBBC entitled School Committee Conferences, Conventions, and Workshops under the Section entitled School Committee Operations. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 4-0. I move for acceptance of a second reading policy BBD entitled School Committee Superintendent Relationship under the section School Committee Operations. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 4-0. I move for acceptance policy BBF under I should move for acceptance of a second reading. Right. Policy BBF uh, entitled Advisory Committees to School Committee under the section School Committee Operations. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unanimous? I move, for four zero. move for acceptance of a second reading. Policy BCBB entitled Notification of School Committee Meetings under section School Committee Operations. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 4 0. Move for acceptance of a second reading, policy CEI, entitled Evaluation of the Superintendent under Section General School Administration. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 4 0. Move for acceptance of a second reading, policy DB, entitled Budget Planning under Section Fiscal Management. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 4 0. Move for acceptance of a second reading. Policy DC, entitled Annual Budget, under the section Fiscal Management. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Yeah. Four zero. I move for, exception, for acceptance of a second reading. Policy GBRM, entitled Smoking, under the section Personnel, comma, Professional. Second. Just a quick comment, we're not encouraging smoking there. Yeah. It's, yeah, right. The policy's entitled smoke, titled smoking, but we are not encouraging smoking there. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 4-0. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. School committee approves smoking, right? Yeah. Oh, please, please. Uh, I move for acceptance of a second reading, policy KCAA, entitled Public Participation at School Committee Meetings under the section General Public Relations. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 4 0. Just to refresh, these are all policies that uh, the policy subcommittee is reviewing approximately 100 of our yeah. policies. Um, many of them are the result of uh, communication from the Mass Association of School Committees about policies that they're updating, and others are just policies that we're reviewing because they haven't been Correct. reviewed in a while. Correct? Correct. Okay. So those are all the second readings. Next we have proposals for, wait, okay, Toronto and Foreign Travel. No, I think we're on to the first reading. Of we're in four, I'm trying to figure item, out. Item five. Item five. Item correct. First reading we have um, <coughs> just a few. Right? Yes. Correct. I think so Mr. Buckley, if you want to. And I think these are some of the policies that we pulled out the last time. That's correct. Okay. Uh, one oh, one question was. about, or there was a one was because that and his 
and or his her a designee, which we which we took out, right? Yes. Right. Okay, so. So. Do you want me to take the lead? Yeah, seat? go for it. Okay. I'll second. I'd like to bring into motion first reading of policy DFD funding proposals and applications under fiscal management. Second. Okay, so this is a slight revision to a propo uh, funding proposals and applications. Uh, policy DFD for first reading. Any discussion? Just to clarify, there was a question about the and or his designee right. Correct. the last time, and we went back to the MASC policy, and there was just some typos when we had okay. brought it forth the first time, so okay. this corrects it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 4 0. I'd like to bring to motion a revised first reading of policy DJEJ. Payment and procedures under fiscal management. Second. So what have we? What, so what have we done here? Is this from? Pretty much the rewording from. The, from MASC. Yeah. Okay. And just want to look at what the old one had to say. So, Mr. Chairman, I believe the policy only was that first right. paragraph. Yeah. Right. That's right. Right. This goes into more through. detail on two. Um, payment procedures and <clears throat> dealing with the funds. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 4 0. I'd like to bring to a motion a revised reading, or sorry, a revised first reading of policy GAHB political activities under personnel. Second. Now we had this, this is the policy that basically instructs school personnel if that are running for office as to what the rules or regulations are and what they can and cannot do uh, within the school district and in terms of dealing with students, parents, et cetera. That is correct. And okay. the, the black is what we just had originally, but we added to, right. but also kept in what we had before, previously. Yep. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 4 0. I'd like to make a motion to have a revised first reading of policy GBA compensation guides and contracts under personnel professional. Second. And this once is just again, a this is simple change in language words. from uh, MASC. Yes. Okay. Well, actually, I think, I think this yeah. one, this one, I this one expands it because it only referred to one union contract. Oh, right. Yeah, it only said the NREA. That's right. Correct. Which yeah, and we wanted to attend. All, all, yeah. all employee group contracts. Correct. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 4 0. And, and again, um, our policy manual, the updated ones won't be there tomorrow, but is available on the website, correct? Policy, that's correct, Mr. Chairman. It is there. It's, um, it's very up to date, exclusive of obviously right. what you're acting on tonight. Right. Um, and, and to a point you made a moment ago, if I could. Um, while the policy subcommittee is reviewing some policies that haven't been reviewed for a while, I think, I think the school committee has done a very good job through the policy subcommittee over the years of not letting policies fall too far out of date. And I think right now, um, the furthest back we might be reviewing a policy that hasn't been reviewed for a period of time is maybe five years. I'll say we did a pretty big one about five years ago. Yeah. yeah. Remember that? So yeah. I, think, I, think, I think that's good. Yeah. So what we're doing, with the policy subcommittee and I, um, it's just looking back on some of those as well and just seeing, you know, if there's a need for, for anything. And, and I think we still have, I think we're about two thirds of the way through that, that large list, would you yeah. say? So we made some pretty good progress and we, we're meeting again next week, so. Great. Okay, next, item six. Um, it's a review and discussion of some existing policies that we have, and this relates uh, to uh, a meeting <coughs> that we had at the athletic subcommittee last month and we had a representative of the softball league in to speak with us, and I'll get into some of the other specifics during subcommittee reports. But one of the things that they're interested in is placing uh, sponsorship signs, I'll call them, on the fence at the little school. Um, there is some question as to whether those would be advertisements or, spon or sponsorships, and I still have some question after reading the, the, um, the policies here. Um, there's also a question of uh, the couple, couple members of the um, 
Parks and Recreation, uh, Parks and Rec Committee are members of the Athletic Subcommittee, and Parks and Rec has a policy, um, although they do have them at the Little League field, it's because that they were grandfathered in, but Parks and Rec has a policy that at other youth fields, they don't allow leagues to place signs. Not that that should have an impact on what we decide here, but I think we have to consider that. But they don't, they, they don't allow leagues to place signs? Right, on, right to make money for the leagues. Yeah. So for example, Parks and Rec places signs on the, at the, at the turf field, mm -hmm. which Mr. Bernard has to approve those if there are any new ones, but all of those funds go to Parks and Rec for the entire Parks and Rec department, not just a specific league. So I'm willing to listen to <coughs> input here, but what I was gonna recommend is that this is something that the policy committee take on, um, that it, discuss with the Recreation D Committee and Recreation Department what their exact policy is, and then come back to the school committee so then we can discuss and take a vote on whether we wanna change our policies. My, my, my reading is that our policies would not allow it because I see them as advertisements and not sponsorships. I, I don't know if any of you feel different on that, I think. Well, there was one part of the policy such partnerships are based on sound principles and benefit the educational welfare of students. Right, and that right, that would case. not be the case as far as I'm concerned. And also, so. and then we, lay, so that, that's the corporate business benefactor sponsorship, but, and then they, in, in advertising, we say no advertising at all. Right. So I would have a hard time under our existing, and, and I, actually, I actually did hear from uh, Softball again, and I, I got back to them saying that we were discussing it tonight. I would have a hard time seeing how we could allow this under our current policies. I don't know, Mr. Bernard, if you have any input. So I, I, I think I do, Mr. Chairman. I think that's correct, your assessment of what got talked about at the last athletic subcommittee meeting. So I think, I think the spirit of what came out of that meeting was to see if there was an appetite on the part of the school committee to go back and have the policy subcommittee frame a, a, a proposed draft new policy. That's, I, that was the sense I got um, from, the, the, from that meeting, is whether or not the committee is interested in potentially opening up for sponsorships at, um, I'll say at the little school or other like facilities that we, um, you know, I, is, under, is under your jurisdiction. I, 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 you know, I, I, per, I understand why SAFA wants to do it. I mm -hmm. personally have a problem with doing it on a, at a school. Can, can I make a suggestion? Yes. We have an athletic subcommittee meeting tomorrow Correct. No, we don't. Uh, uh, yes. Is it tomorrow? Yes. <laughs> we have an athletic subcommittee tomorrow at 1230. I don't have it on my calendar. I think Mr. Venezia will be back. And I think, you know, where he's a second member of that committee representing the school committee, maybe it might be a good item to have on on the agenda for that meeting and see just exactly what, what is the feeling about moving forward if, if, in fact, there is a desire to move forward by bringing something through to the policy subcommittee and ultimately to the school committee. Yeah, I guess... I think that makes sense. Uh, I also would think that at some level we'd have input from um, Parks and Rec. Well, yeah, also the principal of Little School. Yeah. I, I mean, to, to get, to get um, Miss Molly's opinion. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if we were to do it, we're going to limit the kind of they'd be the kind of banners that you see at the at the turf field now. I I, I think that was, you know, the sense from right. from softball that you know that was you know, they were looking at something like that. Yeah. I guess the, 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 the issue that I had, you know, the issue that I, per I, don't, I, I don't object to, I think, as I said, I think the subcommittee should look at it and come back with recommendations after consulting with others, including Parks and Rec. But the thing that always, I always come back to is not that the signs themselves are going to be harmful to children, but those businesses putting those banners there, they've got three or 400 kids every day and teachers and parents seeing those things. And that's just, I can see why Softball wants to do it because that's a huge benefit for those businesses. But I, I just don't know if it's something that, <coughs> that we wanna do. And I think having Scott on the subcommittee and also being a, a, a from the little school district um, is helpful too in that. So well, if, it, if no one objects, that's, that's what my charge would be to have this, the policy subcommittee take a look at it. I mean, I'm, we have a meeting next Tuesday, right? We have a meeting okay. next Tuesday morning, yes. We can talk about it then. Um, I just have three comments, I guess, first. I mean, the one thing is I think we should eliminate two of these policies because they're literally repetitive. 
it's the same policy in two different places. Right. <clears throat> so I think that's one thing we should do, first of all, is Yeah, I was wondering, I was wondering that policy. myself. Word for word. Yes. They're, they're in word for word in two different sections in the same policy. Right. So I think we should eliminate two of those. Um, just for a quick overview, it looks like the policy on, on sponsorships, number five sort of opens up the door a little bit to some advertising. It's not advertising, it's putting the logo you know, at putting a logo on things. Um, so the question is, so I guess that's what sort of opens it up a little bit if we wanted it. And then the advertising, so you have to, you know, differentiate between sponsorship and advertising. My, obviously the big concern is the, the slippery slope of things. If you allow, if you start allowing advertising, where does it end? My concern is the only, just to, because I naturally try to, argue the other side as well and so w the community is very good to the schools there is a lot of sponsorship that goes on a lot of donations that do go on so I do think it's important to recognize the contributions from some of the local businesses but I, I think I, I share the concern about there being too much advertising but at the same time want to want the ability to be able to recognize some of the local businesses that do give a lot of money and to our school and a lot of donations and so so he has the maybe there's a way for the sponsorship just to be broad enough to be able to do that but I don't that's a, that's know. a good idea because it may be broaden it because one of I didn't explain it clearly we're, we're looking for softball um, to help us fund some things here at the at the high school field which correct girls softball also uses maybe help with the scoreboard and some other things batting cages etc and they're looking for ways to raise money to do that. And one of their ideas is to put signs, banners on the fence, just field one at the, at the little school, which is the, the main field. But if you broaden it, but you know, the, the, the question is, um, I, I, I appreciate what softball is trying to do here. Um, you know, they're trying to come up with ideas to raise money. Mm -hmm. but. Then I also look at, do we want to put an entire community, uh, you know, one of the school districts up in arms because, you know, parents don't want signs out in, you know, the playground. Well, would, it, yeah, the, would it be more appropriate to possibly <clears throat> have them at the high school field versus at the elementary school? I mean, I know they're not seeking that, but would that be more acceptable? That, that almost... I'm not saying I, I'm not saying I approve of it, but that almost would make more sense. But then people would say they're not going to get as, as much value out of it because there's a lot more use of the little school fields. Right. You, you, you do have signs at the turf field. What what allows that? That's Parks and Rec. Park. Yeah, that's Park and, and that's and it's it's also it's that field is owned by the Parks and Rec. Yeah. So w when we did the deal for that field, we seeded that field. The school department <laughs> gave up the ownership right. of that field to Parks and Rec. John still has final approval. You're supposed to show John any new content, is any new content mm. of ads that are, that are going to go there. In the past, we've had, in fact, if you look at this baseball scoreboard, it's faded, but you can still see Mountain Dew and Pepsi on the baseball scoreboard. So in the past, we've allowed um, large corporations to sponsor things like scoreboards. That's I mean, fantastic. It, you know, it, it was a long seems. time ago. Oh, prior to well, it had to be way prior to this because oh, that's been there. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Would it would it make more sense to possibly allow this to happen at the high school field versus at the elementary school? Maybe I think I yeah, I think the answer is yes. Yeah, yeah I could I could but say. I wonder too. Maybe maybe the policy limits the the style of the advertising too. Maybe it isn't banners. You know, maybe it's a more. Uh, kind of refined advertisement, like an honor plaque or something like that. That, like, or I, was th I was thinking at the little school, maybe it's something. It's a plaque on the concession stand. It's maybe not quite as. Uh, yeah, I, I hear what you. You know what I mean? It is, it, it's it's it a little more be, aesthetically pleasing. It could perhaps. be a change. It might be a plaque that's that whatever's on the plaque yeah. is changeable. So if you have right. other people over the years, right. or somebody, you know, maybe it doesn't necessarily have to be banners on the. On the on the outfield fence, necessarily, you know, maybe the policy gets framed. So, I mean, in I'm such just thinking way. of visibility. You know, if that's a concern for young students, the visibility factor at the high school right. field, you know, is not impacting. I feel students, you know, in the school, 
out at recess right. versus mm -hmm. at the little school. I know what you're that saying. Would, you know, like I, I understand. I think there's some. I think the high school is a good idea. I think John's idea of, of looking into different types of promotions the and sponsorships and the styles of, of banners, I think it's all um, something that should be discussed by the athletic subcommittee with. I agree. And, and John, you can have discussions with Chris and and. and I, I have. I actually was over there today when yeah. we had our, Patrick and I had a, a meeting. Then I had a follow-up meeting on some other issues with Chris, and I did talk with her about that. <clears throat> and um, and I since we've been talking about it tonight, I just emailed Marty Tilton and Rita Mullen and asked if they could bring a copy of the Parks and Rec policy to okay. tomorrow's meeting. Um, but I personally, I think if I could be so blunt as to say, I think tomorrow having a discussion more about what's the direction that group sees it going, and then maybe bringing that to the policy subcommittee okay. on, on next Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. And you know, one thing the one thing that Scott said is interesting is if we are ever to allow it, then maybe we could say. Um, not only can softball, but the little school can have some businesses place some things there, some banners or whatever, and the little school could also benefit Recognize. with some funds, mm -hmm. not just softball. So there's a lot to think about. Um, we do have, we really do have an athletics subcommittee meeting tomorrow, right? You're not kidding me. We have to say that. At I'm glad you told me because it was not on my calendar. It's gonna, it was going to come up later tonight. Tell me okay. it's at 7:30. Yeah. Okay. So sub, uh, subcommittee will take this and- We can address it afterwards and if Mr. Bernard can maybe give us an update next Tuesday. Yeah, I would say- I, I would expect to have a little more information out of tomorrow's yeah. meeting and then yeah, we can talk. Either the next meeting or the first <laughs> meeting in December, probably more likely we can- uh, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on this? Any other comments? I mean, is, is there anything, is there any timing of the essence on this? I mean, are there- No, I think they, I mean, they'd want to, if they want to do it, they're going to want to have it, you know, starting in April, May, when softball, May, when softball starts up. So we, we have time. I mean, they're obviously, they'd obviously want to sell. And would they be things that were, like, were brought in for the games or would they be there all the time? I think the they're other. planning on it being there all the time that well that's another thing for the that's policy subcommittee to committee you c consider you could have there is reference in the existing policies now about the length of time that something but you could have you put the signs up on the weekends uh, for a tournament for you know weeknight games or w not so they're not there during or the day or a defined period yeah, exactly that's the thing but if, if the concern is little kids see right that's what i'm saying right you could very easily just have have them at night. Something that drapes over the fence that's right. there during a game that they remove at the end of the game. Too. Yeah. Like some sort of a right. clip or something. That, yeah. yeah. That's what they, I mean, from the soccer tournament, we, that's what we did, you know? The weekend of the soccer tournament, we just clipped the signs up and took them down when, the, when it was over. So yeah. that's a good idea, Scott. All right, anything else? So between Table tomorrow down. and yeah. next Tuesday and, okay. Okay. All right, now we get. Okay. Yeah. Now we get to the uh, the Michael part of the show tonight. Michael's got about three things to present to us. Uh, uh, first one will be enrollment projections, correct? I do. I do have a brief PowerPoint. You didn't even hear it, though. Um, so I do have a brief PowerPoint that will highlight some of the updates to our enrollment projections now that the October 1 enrollment numbers have been calculated and are, are um, submitted. Um, so in the packet was the presentation as well as that enrollment report with some narrative and some analysis that you, in the same format that you've been typically receiving over the last uh, few years at this time. So um, in terms of the, the methodology that we use as a reminder, uh, we use a methodology referred to as the pro progression rate method, and essentially what that does is it essentially assumes what's happened in the past will continue to happen in the future. Um, so it's a pretty basic technique that cal calculates the ratio of number of children in one grade in one year um, compared to the number of children who progress or move on uh, the next year and enroll in the grade the following year. So basically, you take these percentages and you um, do some historical analysis over three or five year or ten or, or ten year periods, and you can develop some some ratios um, of you know progression ratios amongst one grade to the next um, to predict enrollment. Um, certainly, um, you know impacts of um, you know real estate developments, turnover of homes, all those types of you know changes in the in in the real estate market and the economy and so forth can 
impact the cohort, cohort numbers and these ratios. So we uh, do try to you know, make adjustments accordingly based on the trends and some of the analysis that we do, that we uh, have done and the data that's out there to try to predict enrollment as accurately as we can. Um, given that the, the trends have been relatively uh, reliable and, and stable in, in North Reading, we tend to use the longer 10-year you know, period trend. So the average over the, the 10 years is typically the, the, the ratios that we do use when predicting enrollment. Um, and as I said, residential developments, turnover homes, and so forth will imp impact, could impact the numbers. So just starting to look at kind of in the, in the past, this is our enrollment that goes back to 1950. As you can see, enrollment kind of grew uh, pretty steadily, um, you know, through into, uh, the you know, up to the 1970s, where it peaked at 3,461. That's kind of incredible, considering uh, what the population of the town was. Sure. Right? And it was a lot lower than it is now that we had such a high yeah. school population. Was, you were seeing very high birth rates yeah. at this time, baby boomer generation, everything yep. really um, uh, causing the enrollment to, to spike. Then obviously it kind of, it's almost like two bell curves, and then it kind of uh, decreased pretty steadily hitting a low in, of 1,926 in the, the early 1990s, I'm mean, sorry, in the 1980s, and then it began to peak again up all the way up until 2008, where it reached over the last you know, 10 years a high of 2,812. And then it's been, uh, you know, the, the, the decline has been more moderate over the last 10 years, but it's been, we experienced some small increases here and there. In 2014, there was a small increase but it's been kind of a moderate decline. And the 2000, October 1, 2017 enrollment for this fiscal year, 2018, enrollment stood at 2,493, which was only a decline of six students from, from last year. Um, so again, this is just the most recent history, the 10-year history. Um, again, as you can see, it's kind of a moderate decline since 2008. Um, you know, some peaks here and there, but you know, not, not too much happening, relatively stable with a moderate decline um, over, the last, over the last 10 years. So because things have been relatively stable, you know, the, the biggest things that are impacting enrollment are, are what, the, what the birth rates have been and has there been a steady number of births to North Reading residents, and that has been the case in North Reading. And then looking at, you know, what are the signs and what's the data showing is in terms of new in migration, you know, coming into North Reading? Has there been increased turnover homes? What's some of the real estate developments out there that could impact, um, you know, future enrollment in the data? So if you look at our revised 10-year enrollment projections, I would quite, I will say this is, looks quite a bit different than maybe it did a year ago as we, because we looked at some of the numbers. Th these numbers do change every year. And I think what's clear is because we're seeing that more than in migration, and I think that, that real estate market is certainly, um, has increased over the last few few years, you're not seeing that as much of a decline as maybe a year or two ago we may have been predicting based on the numbers. So um, over the next five years, this, again, this is pre-K through 12 district-wide enrollment, um, staying relatively stable, you know, maybe a slight moderate decline from 2004-44, um, you know, five years from now, potentially 2004-27, but again, not, not huge changes. And then maybe after you know, five years out, you start to see a little bit of an increase in enrollment with um, it potentially reaching 10 years from now, 2,483. So relatively stable, not, not a lot happening here. So Michael, for, district -wide. for, for next year, um, you're pretty confident with that number because we're going to see the drop off at the middle in the high school. The, and those both yep. are definite, right? Correct. But you're still probably expecting maybe a few more at K through five or pre-K through five. That's correct. And we expect that's correct. Had this so, year, right? Um, we'll get it. Yeah. So the middle school is projected to decline, although not as significantly maybe as we did uh, predict a couple of years ago at this time. Right. But it's expected to decline by about 14 students. The high schools are going to experience the largest change. It's almost 40 kids. Um, fewer. Yeah. So, this, so they'll see the biggest change, and then the elementary, like I said, stabilize, stabilizing a few a few additional students. Um, but as we kind of get, so here you can see kind of those in-grade combinations over the next 10 years. Here's our actual enrollment. 
these are the major in-grade combinations that we've come accustomed to, to looking at and analyzing. Um, so that K through five enrollment staying, again, relatively stable. Pre-K through five, maybe going up by a couple students. Here's that 14 student drop at the middle school next year. And here's that the drop at the, the high school that we just spoke of. Um, and then, you know, K through 12 enrollment, you know, again, going down, but, you know, not maybe significantly as we, as, as significant as we maybe we once thought a, a few years ago at this time. Well, the good news there is in 2000, 2021, we'll actually be within the uh, amount of students we've got at the high school. Yeah, 740. 740. Right. So we're getting. I mean, not that we have had any prob trouble accommodating them, but this school was built for no, we haven't. 40 students. Yeah, we haven't. So. Um, so if you look at now, if you get into the actual element, you know each each level here, and these are where the kind of the challenges come in, the fluctuations between grade levels, and even though enrollment may be going down K through five or pre-K through five, the in-grade changes from from grade to grade do present some challenges, and this is where we get into those budget conversations. So, um, you know, the enrollment projections is really key. It's really the beginning of, I think, the, you know, the budgetary development process for the next fiscal year as you look at kind of what's happening between grade levels. And if you look at, um, you know, this chart here, which certainly projects out over the, the next five years, um, you see our actual in green, the blue is the projections. Um, you know, you get a sense of, of some of the challenges that we'll be, um, you know, dealing with in the near future. Right away, you look at next year, we have the higher kindergarten enrollment um, at 179 right now. You know, as you know, we added an additional full day kindergarten section. Given the, the birth statistic and the rate from five or six years earlier, which is actually um, a lower birth rate, which has been pretty stable, you can, you know, adding about 17 or 18% from the birth rate for those students September 1st through August 31st, five, five years earlier. Um, you know, we could see a decline in kindergarten enrollment next year. Um, but then the birth rate the following year goes right back up and that, that enrollment uh, at the kindergarten level is expected to go to increase potentially as high as we've seen it. So these are interesting data points that we'll have to watch. Um, the kindergarten enrollment because of the full day kindergarten option and so forth is, has been relatively, you know, difficult to predict in, you know, in recent years. But, Typically, then 18% higher than the, the birth rates five years earlier has been about what that kindergarten amount has been. If you look at grade one, um, you know you see an increase there, so there'll certainly be um, something we'll have to watch as we get into the budgetary process for next year. And you can see some of these changes. Um, overall enrollment staying steady, but there'll certainly be some some staffing changes amongst grade levels, and we'll have to kind of see the, the budgetary impact of some of these these changes amongst between grade levels right but again when you take 18 just take grade two 18 students less but that's over three schools and nine or ten correct classrooms. so that exactly. doesn't really make correct much of a difference when it, if any right. difference when it comes exactly to so you can you can see um because right you're dealing with three schools over all these grade levels um you know some of you know 12 or 15 students 20 students does not necessarily make a big difference Exactly right. So, I think the biggest thing to watch next year is what's happening, you know, yeah. with the kindergarten. You know, we won't know definitively until you know maybe the middle of February or so. But um, you know, we'll have to watch that. <clears throat> the middle school level, um, as we as we've come to project, you know, we saw that decline of about you know from 577 to 548 um, this this year. Um, we had predicted that it was maybe the decline maybe wasn't as significant as we even predicted. Uh, we are seeing a, a higher percentage of st of students progressing from grade five to grade six in recent years. So that uh, percentage is 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 lower. It's only about maybe one and a half to two percent um, of students um, maybe not progressing over to from grade five to grade six. Um, John, what was the middle school capacity for the new school? Do you remember? So, so the middle school, the middle school is doing. We're doing really well in terms of yeah. we can handle up to 630 kids there, 
and we're not touching, we're not even close to that. So, yeah. So you had these higher grade levels again have moved on to the high school. Right. Now they're getting to the point where they're starting to sort of graduate, and these lower grade levels are starting to work their way up. So. We're going to, we're kind of, what's happening here is you're starting to see the middle school enrollment maybe go down for another year and then start to level off and maybe, um, you know, somewhat average somewhere in the 545 to 550 range over the next five years. And then you're going to see the high school experience, the largest, the largest decline. So if we go to the high school, here we are at 812. It's almost like, a, you know, a, a 10 year high. Um, and then as, again, those higher class sizes begin to graduate and the lower class sizes work their way onto the high school, um, you'll see the largest change in enrollment um, you know, going down next year and stabilizing for a year. And then, again, I think we see this leveling out around that 715, 720 uh, amount um, you know, over the next three to five years as we, as we look to the numbers in the future. So again, it's important to do this every year. You know, the enrollment projections are most accurate. You know, the first few years when you get beyond, you know, five years, um, obviously they become less accurate and it's important to, to recalculate them on an annual basis. Um, so that's, and I think that just kind of tells you what's sort of happening. You know, district-wide enrollment experiencing a moderate decline over the next five years before we might see a district-wide, you know, enrollment increase. Again, again, the most accurate in the early years, um, not as accurate when you get you know, five years out. We are seeing evidence that the economy and real estate market is continuing to improve in migration of, of, of you know, families coming in with school-aged children to North Reading is, is occurring. And um, there's definitely an increase in homes being sold, new homes being built. So we'll have to see how some of that data and that turnover um, of homes impacts the, the numbers. But, I think right now for next year, I think it looks pretty, pretty accurate. Any questions for Michael on enrollment? Good job, Michael. I think, um, you know, the one, the one thing we know that's good is that there won't be any more large housing developments where, right. you know, 150, 200, 300 right. houses are built. Yeah, I'm not seeing that. So. Yeah, I didn't meet with Daniel McKnight, and yeah, there's, just, there's not, not a lot of any, that happening. Do you have any other presentations or? Um, not for the, not on PowerPoint. No, but I mean, oh, oh. Okay. okay, so you don't yeah. have one, for, no more PowerPoint because I was going to let you go. Mr. Webster, I do yeah. have one, one quick okay. question. Since you just brought, talked about the housing development, since yeah. we do have housing development coming in, I understand it's 55 plus. Yeah. Is there any, is there any worry that there's going to be an impact at all? Is, has that been calculated into enrollment projections at all? So I've, I've met with the town and there's, a, there is that 55 plus development. They don't. It's hard to say, but they're not thinking that's going to have a huge impact on enrollment. I think it's clear that it could be some, you know, some families that move in there with school-aged children. Um, but based on what they've seen in similar developments, it hasn't had a significant impact in the last 10 years. But, e yeah. but even yeah. even a minor impact, I mean, to numbers could be. You all, that's going to be a lot of was, lot of homes. Also, was a factor of, of of people that are residents selling their home. Right. Yeah, that's taking increased. advantage of the, that. That was factored into Pulte's presentation. I know. Right. Yeah. Well, but but even that, I mean, if, if people did sell their home and and go into the home, that would presumably be the new person moving in. That, that's might, my right. point. Yeah, it might that's be. Yeah, so there could, that could be yeah. a family that buys that home. So that that had right. definitely that, that factored could be in. a could potentially be a spike I for think, a yeah, couple I, of I years when they came behind. Very few students coming directly from the new. That I agree. Yeah, I think it's more. It's more. No, if someone but, yeah. moves from yeah. the town. Yeah. And so and we've seen we've seen an increase in that in the, the turnover of homes. And so we've certainly, in, that has certainly played into the, the projections. Well, and, 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 the, and the lack of, a, and the fewer students leaving, I think probably relates a lot to the fact that we have the new high school and middle school. Yeah. So we're retaining students more, you know, that, that where it said it used to be a drop, you'd lose sixth graders, you'd lose ninth graders. It seems like we haven't had as yeah, much of a drop that's in true. the last couple of I, years. I, I personally, and, and we factored, I think, when we were back proposing this project, I think they factored about a 3% change. Mm -hmm. It's been much more than that. So I think it's more than just the, the actual physical we, building. We were losing 12 we were, plus we were, percent We would on use 12% yep. as a factor. What's it now, 4%? Five, yeah. Five, yeah. Five percent? I think these assume between yeah. 4 and 5%. Yeah. So you figure we're losing last five seven years. or eight kids. I know. And there were years we'd lose 20 to yeah. 30 kids sometimes. I mean, I think so most recently, I think, we, I think we only lost 2% in the most recent year. Yeah. yeah. Between 8th and ninth grade. Thank so. you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Where are we?
we? Routine In matters. Minutes. Yeah. minutes. We have one set of minutes, I think, right? Yes. I've looked through these and they look spiffy to me. I see no changes in the minutes. Unless anybody else has anything, I'll accept a motion to um, for the minutes of October 16th, 2017. Motion to accept the open session minutes of October 16th. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Four zero. Okay, Michael, um, budget update. Yes, so thank you. So the October budget update um, that, again, was originally going to be presented um, at the last meeting um, is, was included in your packet this evening. This reflects financial activity through the middle of October. And I will say there's not a lot of new information here that was presented at the September budget update. Certainly there's been a lot more activity and, and um, supplies and materials purchased and uh, you know, items encumbered for the year on the report. Um, but as I, it typically has been the case, and I've, as I presented in the past, we certainly um, exceeded the amount budgeted for our special education prepayment. So you can certainly see this. Um, a balance reflected in the special education tuition account on the expense side of the um, report. Um, but I think, you know, right now we'll certainly, that has provided some level of flexibility um, that we'll have to certainly watch as we move through the rest of the fiscal year if that, those funds will be needed to be you know, encumbered and not for anticipated you know, tuitions for, for students. Uh, we have encumbered all the utility expenses, so we'll just continue to monitor the cost of utilities closely this fiscal year. Right now, you know, we haven't really gotten into the, the heart of the, the heating season, but you know, everything I'm, from what I'm seeing is within budgeted ranges. Um, I presented at the last report, we've certainly experienced um, some additional need costs to upkeep um, not only the middle school, the high school, but you know, every school throughout the district. Um, some maintenance and some grounds needs in the areas of landscaping, plumbing, you know, some HVAC heating and cooling repairs. There's been a need for some, some lighting repairs and so forth. So nothing to cause alarm. You know, we're certainly managing you know, the, the needs of um, all campuses that they arise in in the areas of, of grounds and maintenance <coughs> that, that we'll monitor throughout the school year. Um, the food service program closed out the month of September with um, a, a net loss of about $10,500. However, that is only you know, slightly higher than what we forecasted as the program typically experiences a loss in September as we have the startup you know, food costs and so forth. Um, I did receive, um, since this uh, report was uh, prepared, the October you know, P&L statement, and there was a, a small net profit in October. Um, and we are seeing some positive trends um, in the first opening two months of the school year. Um, the mail sold per, per year are up you know, in just about every school. Uh, certainly the middle, the middle school, we have seen about a 10 or 12% increase in September and October. The elementary schools are up slightly. And even the breakfast uh, program sales at the, at, are up at the, at the high school level. So we are seeing some positive trends. Michael, the costs are just because of pre-buying a lot of supplies and stuff at the yeah, beginning of the year, so, Start yeah. Costs, that's where we, yeah. that's where that production and food costs and so forth. Right, yeah, okay. That, that first month. Um, but again, it'll be closely, as we have come to uh, do over the last several years, to, to monitor the, you know, the food service program, given, as we as we know, there there is no general fund subsidy for the food service program this year. Scott? Yeah, can I, one question on that. I know that... I think last year when we were talking about the food service program, I think Julie had the suggestion about making sure that if conferences, if we're hosting things, that we potentially use use Correct. the food service. And yeah. have there been our? I imagine there's going to be basketball tournaments and things like that that are coming up. Are do you know if, if there's going to be an increase in that? Because yeah, I was very nervous with no cushion at all in the budget for this. That the yeah. PD day did. Yes. Was they were here selling yep. PD Day, NEMASC conference today. Yep. Um, we've been pushing the catering menu. I sent an email out at the start of the fall season to the, all of the athletic coaches, much I, like I had done at the spring season, to encourage that. We're not certainly not mandating that. Quite honestly, some people aren't 
some groups aren't taking advantage of that. They're still hosting their banquets offsite. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think you know maybe over time, you know, I would hope that that would catch on a little bit more. But um, if you the website has a great deal of information about the catering options that are available. But I think it's fair to say that certainly I would say the things that the central office has control over, like the end pen day. Yeah. We mm. exclusively. Yes. Use chartwells. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't we don't even entertain outside. But the banquets, I think, there's just a, a belief, a mindset. The athletic banquets, I'm talking about, right. that they like to go yeah. off site, right, and do some or do something yeah. different on their own. I know yeah, we did a few yeah, last yeah. Year, which hopefully we'll, we'll we did do a couple last down. year. Yeah. yeah, and I think um, we'll see some more this year. I do. Yeah, um, I mean, certainly we, you know, we forecasted a, a higher catering, you know, revenue, and that was part yeah. of of why we feel we could we could break even. You know, we, we lost about eight thousand dollars last year, and that's mm -hmm. we thought we can make that up by increasing the, the yeah. catering and well, the yeah. events. So. And even things like the performance art center. I mean, making sure that the dance studios know that if, if there was an option, I don't know. I mean, to do yep. anything. I mean, I just we're getting more rentals. We've been, we've I know that we've budgeted a higher Correct. more rentals as well. We're seeing and that. So coupling yep. coupling the rentals with the food service to try to. Sure. And have them help each other would be sure. useful. Yeah, no, it's a good idea. Yeah, I think that's <coughs> all going to be very important for us to continue to push and be creative and um, you know, capture as much of the, the other revenue as we can. Mike, one more question. I Julie. just have one question, and I don't know if this is the proper time to ask it, but there was a lot of questions about snacks yes, being I was sold bring up the same topic. through Chartwells. Mm -hmm. Particularly, I think the concern was mostly at the elementary level. So I don't know if there's anything that we can do um, as a committee or during you know, meeting time to perhaps open up a discussion perhaps with parents and Chartwells to kind of facilitate. Yeah, I was, I was going to make a recommendation tonight, um, same topic. Yeah. I think one of, the, one of the good points that was made during this whole discussion on social media was could there be a list of snacks that are sold, may, especially mainly in the elementary school, I think, mm -hmm. but at all schools, the parents say it's great, we know it's on the menu for lunch, but it'd be great if, the, especially at the elementary school, they knew what snacks were being offered at lunchtime. That, I, think that would, I, I think that would be a good start. And then, and because some of the parents were claiming, oh, they aren't healthy, and then of course they are. They have to, we can't sell anything that doesn't meet well, see, that's, the state guidelines. But I don't know, because I know meals have to have have to be under, you know, certain guidelines. Yeah, but the snacks, we, we can't. <laughs> I, so I, I had heard about the concern, yeah. and, and I, I think, assured the person that had brought it to my attention that we were within the guidelines that we needed to be within. Okay. But I did confirm that with the food okay. services director. I also met with her <clears throat> and suggested, and she has followed up with this already, um, Anna McGovern is in our rotation of the Around the Schoolyard articles, okay. mm -hmm. and I suggested that she take her turn as an opportunity to, to speak about sure. the snack idea. options and, and the guidelines that USDA um, puts out. Um, but mm -hmm. she assured me that the yeah. snacks that are offered are within, the, okay. you know, I think, like a Pop-Tart, for example, it's a whole grain Pop-Tart. Okay. okay. Um, that was my concern because I didn't know yeah, exactly we, we, we what. We can't. We cannot I sell. I remind the, com the committee that we went through an extensive an uh, audit. coordinated program with right. you, right. an audit of not only the financials and you know the process of you know processing of, you know federal and state you know claims for reimbursement, but as well as the nutritional you know, components and what was being served. And nothing has changed. That was only a year and a half ago that they came right. out and spent an entire week. In the district of DESC going through everything. So here's another question. Do we as a school district, do we have say as to what is sold? Can we tell Chartwells we don't want to sell Pop-Tarts, for example, or chocolate milk? Or, I mean, are we by contract obligated to sell what Chartwells no, wants I mean, I to sell? We, it's a team, you know, it's a team approach. I think we have the right to um, you know, offer our opinions and feedback, and we we often get with students at time to time and do focus groups and do surveys, and um, so you know I think we can certainly work together and provide feedback and suggestions, and recommend. Okay. You know, but I I, we feel. <coughs> I do think if we could at least provide 
the list of snacks that are offered to elementary school students. Yeah. That would be that would be a good start because then the parents are informed. Like a posting on the yeah. website. Yeah. The and website. also like, you know, at some schools it seemed like it was certain, only certain days. Yeah. And others. Like it was one day and some but at another was, school it was three, five right. days. So that seemed odd to me that there wouldn't be consistency yeah, among. I, I don't know on okay. the, that point. Yeah, parents seem confused about that. But the listing will will I will go along yeah. with towards helping what we're, what we're serving, and if we have because the way that with the lunches we have the nutritional information Correct. next yeah. to each yeah. Yeah, I think it's, item. I don't know I if have that's. To, I have I talked to Miss McGovern, the food service director, about that option. Yeah. And about the can you be? And I think there's challenges given the NutriSlice program menus in terms of getting Correct. snacks to appear on the website in just like the, the type A lunches and so forth where you can see all the nutritional components. Well, I'm, I'm just... Like a, list, a list could be... A list of yeah. items, yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's and a good I, start. And I also, you know, Anna is very accessible to people. Email <laughs> and a phone call. I put her name and her yeah. phone right. number She's and her email address to, up there you know, and said she'll... If there's a question about is it this many days at one school, I think that could be very easily answered by her. Mm -hmm. You because know, okay. I'm hearing Doritos and Pop-Tarts, and that just is alarming to me. They are so available. I think they we need available. to at least let parents know what what is for sale, how often, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah we can helpful. drop lots of, you know, lists Postings posting on, on the website. Yeah. I mean, there's Great. a lot of information out there. Great. Thank you. I, mean, I, think, I, think, I think with with the budget, I know that we've done a lot, or you've done a lot in the past, putting information out there. And you know, people. Some people aren't going to read all the information out there, and there's nothing we can do about that. But it, it is helpful when somebody's complaining to be able to direct them to exactly somewhere. that. It's right. But you know what's good when people don't read it and they say da da da, and, and you say, you know what? Go to the website. It's there. Correct. And, and then so, you point them there, yeah. and it's there. Yeah, and so the more information. And again, I, right. I don't expect people to know everything. I mean, even tonight. I mean, we didn't know certain things about. Well, that's in the quick links. You know, right. you, you learn. But you know, I, I, I would. I support, agree. I would support having. The information in a place that we could refer them to right sure you know going forward so excellent and it, i don't think something like that would take awfully long either to get no. out there and i imagine there might be a rotation here and there but just you know they may have different things yeah, different seasons but things. it's going to be yeah, similar I similar well, I mean, the, all year, the, I imagine. the meals or the, the monthly <coughs> calendar is sent home so if there was just a place on that or right on the that back, says what the snacks right you know well, it's, it's snacks, on, yeah, in snacks a, will be sold on these days at your school and here's what these they are, are the op these right. are what the options are i yeah. think that would be helpful yeah, yeah. I, I, think can yeah I, think I think we can accomplish that all right excellent Snack items, the, you know, the prices of yeah. each, and what's available at each school, what yeah. can they expect. Yeah, that's my, good. My, my only other question on the budget in general, I mean, I just think so many of the cushions and reserve funds were limited in this year's budget. Um, yes, they yeah. were. That's correct. I just, I just am very nervous about that. And so if, you know, <laughs> as things go along, if there are things that are broken, even if it hasn't been, because this shows you what's been spent, it doesn't say what needs to be spent still, uh, so if well, there are. It does, so yeah. it's, it's showing you an, an expended yeah. column in the, the No, no, but I mean like if something breaks down and it just can't oh, be right. replaced right now, that's not necessarily in the numbers. And I just wanna make sure that we're kept up to date, date also because when we're budgeting, that's my concern is that you, if you don't have the money to spend to fix something or to update sure. something, and we're making severe cuts, I wanna make sure that so, as much as we can, we can know that. We, since I've been on the school committee, <clears throat> we've always, um, when so, we've had time, a couple times, we've had to go to the finance committee to get an emergency uh, appropriation to yeah, cover it's things. Been one since I've been here. And I will tell you, I was gonna talk about this in subcommittee reports, but uh, Mr. Bernard and Michael at our last um, finance planning team meeting presented a list of some of the costs that we're now incurring at this school, right. Right. much higher costs than we expected for, for, to run the school. Yeah. Um, a big part, a big, big issue is the wastewater treatment plant, um, mm -hmm. energy right. costs. Uh, snow plowing is a lot more now because it's a lot bigger area. So that means more overtime for custodians in addition to hiring outside companies right. to help us plow. So um, the goal of that, the goal of that exercise was basically to say, we're not 
coming here right now asking you for more money, but we're basically telling you that when we put our budget together for next year, these numbers have to be reflected in that budget. It was, it was, it was to right. bring an awareness. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, I spoke to a little bit earlier in the report that we have seen the, the need for a repair or a more costly repair or um, given the, the amount of the equipment that's now, that we're now trying to service and upkeep, um, mm -hmm. you know, as a whole, you know, you know, it, it's more of a reality that we're dealing with. So it's certainly, there's no cause for an alarm right now. We're certainly managing it <coughs> in the budget and we have done a good job reallocating and, and finding, um, you know, some, some availability within the budget that was appropriated to, to address some of the, the needs. But there's, I think you'll see some of those things in the FY19 budget development. This is where we are right now. This is tighter than I remember being in most mm -hmm. years past at this it is at this early date you know to be has the freeze been put on yet it's it not. not it is not so we, we try to avoid that but yeah. we've certainly been certainly been yeah you know, well yeah and, and <clears throat> i'm hoping there isn't anything but just it, again if there are things that money hasn't been expended but if we had it it really would have been just would be helpful also to know that so that we can make sure that we have the information when we're doing the budgeting mm -hmm. this year about what the reserves are because you know the things that come up that you don't know about and I obviously am not here day to day so I don't know what they are and sure. the more I could learn about that I I would appreciate learning it yeah I mean everything is certainly you know this time of year a little bit tighter certainly on the expense and on the payroll side so there's not as much of that availability of funds in you know, utilities and in transportation and some of these, these line items. Have there been any high out of district placements that we weren't expecting this year? There has not. There has been certainly as it always is in that line item and, and that you know changes from what we budgeted and shifts in, in placements that we're, we're managing. Um, but I think it's you know that's always presents a, a challenge uh, that we're certainly you know working our way through. Um, you know, there's certainly a, a, you know, a possibility that in the very near future, as we pro projected during the, the budget process, that because we you know, we forecasted $125,000 of prepay, <coughs> back, I spoke that we really prepaid two seventy five, dollars and we did that intentionally. You know, I do see us um, in the, <coughs> using the majority of that additional pay you know, for, for tuitions. That was, that was a need mm -hmm. that we, for, you know, for, foresaw as we got to the end of the, the budget process last year. So Mike, we threw you off a little bit there. You pretty much wrapped up or anything I else? Covered, yeah, I covered, yeah. I didn't um, <laughs> speak totally to the, the payroll line items, but there's been no major changes on the payroll side. As the report talks them. about, again, you're seeing just you're seeing the, for instance, the teachers, and the, you know, that, that higher attrition uh -huh. ratio that we budgeted is just you know, less of the funds, but everything is within budget ranges. Um, it'll be important that we, we see the impact of the substitute budget. Um, we are seeing a bit of a, an uptick, uh, higher trend <coughs> needing to appoint long-term substitutes. That, that kind of was, was down a little bit last year. We're seeing that kind of trend back, back upwards. Okay. So that will have to be, be watched closely. Okay, Michael, now also um, not specifically part of the budget, but um, you have a proposal to make to us tonight to approve a new booster and Thank support you. group. And I will say, um, I give these, um, these parents and students a lot of credit. They jumped on this. I've been communicating with Chris Thibodeau for about a month now, and uh, <coughs> I'm, I'm really uh, excited to have this new um, booster group, and it's great that they were able to put it together so quickly. So, Michael? <coughs> yes, thank you. So in, in your packet this evening, there is um, a memorandum um, and the application for recognition by the new booster group that has come forward, the North Reading High School Varsity Girls Hockey Boosters. And I will concur with um, Chairman Webster's comments that I think they did an excellent job pulling the paperwork together and in a very short you know, um, time frame, doing, taking the steps that they needed to take to, um, to, to get established. Um, they have established their own bank account. They have their own FBIN. They have registered with the Secretary of State as a public charity. And I, I put these, but I kind of researched the, the numbers they provided and even included the printout on their on the state website to show that they ha are established and they have their offices and directors. So 
so they're well on their way and uh, have certainly taken all the, the necessary steps to <coughs> and recognized appropriately by, by the school committee. And, um, you know, we've appointed Athletic Director Dave Johnson to be the school liaison to work with them and their fundraising efforts to help. And they're, as stated in their application, their, their primary function would be to financially support the North Reading High School girls hockey players, participating in the co-op program, via you know, donations and fundraising efforts. Um, they would ultimately like to use the funds to help defray the cost of the girls' user fee for, to participate in that co-op program. Um, but you know, I, there's a recommended motion um, in the cover sheet of the memorandum that you know, we certainly support uh, recognition of this, of this booster organization this evening by, by the committee. And just be, before we get to the motion, um, so people understand because it's a co-op, we don't set the fees. And um, the fee is, Michael, is it $1,300 this year or $1,400 that the girls are paying <coughs> to play hockey? So the fee that's assessed by the, the PBD Public Schools, which is the host uh, district, that varies each year based right. on um, the actual cost and how much participants that they have from both North Reading and Linfield. Um, so I believe it was in the range of you know, $1,400 for this year. The North, the North Reading families would pay up to um, the North Reading family cap. So we wouldn't ask any of these families to pay more than $1,300. Um, in some cases, there's siblings and there's multiple right. uh, sport athletes, so they're, they're paying less than that. Um, and the, the district does cover the difference between right. the PBD set fee, which has been in that $1,400 to $1,500 range. Um, and the, the, the North Reading student you know, pays the, the family up to the family cap. And right. so what they're trying to do is Wait, hope to so, defray so some of the class. That's to play <coughs> hockey. Hockey. Wait, so, well, can I just clarify? So, so m most of the time when you play one sport, there's a limit on one sport. You're saying with co-ops, the limit's not the one sport limit, it's the family cap limit? Yes. For one sport? Yes, because we don't set the fees. And they could, yeah. they could do more, but you would still have to pay more. I mean, that seems no, 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 no. We're always no, at the if, family if, cap. No, you're always at the no family cap. Right. Once no, but I'm saying you can you can play more sports and it would still be just the family right. cap. Right. Yes. But if you only play one sport, Hockey, you have to pay the whole family right. cap. Yes. As opposed to yes. And what do boys pe play? Pay for for hockey. Four hundred. We don't have a boys team. We have a varsity hockey right. team. Girls can't. Girls right. could. Girls could right. play on that team if they chose. But what is the fee? Four, it's the four hundred. Four hundred if it's the first sport. Two hundred if it's. But we have no. We don't set the fee. No, but we we don't. We don't have to <laughs> offer right. a co-op program. Right. Yeah. So we do it because there's been students who have right. expressed interest in doing right. that. It's the same thing with gymnastics or skiing wrestling. or wrestling, wrestling right. or. I think those are the gymnastics, skiing, wrestling. I mean, that seems hockey. Right. I think that's right. That's yeah. I mean, I, I'd, I'd be, I, I would personally be interested in understanding what the cost of the committee would be if it was treated like any other sport, where it would only be a maximum of four hundred and. It's. So it costs it's, us about. I imagine it probably. Right, it costs us about seven or eight thousand dollars. Right. right. I would right. say the last two. Minimum years. sport? No, I'm saying total. No, for hockey. Oh, for that one. Just sport. for that one sport. Right. Right. That one total. sport. Right. Under the arrangement that's been, it's probably been about four thousand dollars that it's cost the, you know cover the difference between the fee and what well, it, it has, but I'm saying hockey. it went down it'd be even more. Mm -hmm. but. What was that, Julie? Yeah. That would be for the varsity. Girls hockey. Correct. Just so varsity that. hockey. Correct. From what we, right. from what we are billed from the Peabody. Um, for a varsity team, hockey a, team. Correct. Or for correct. the girls. Girls varsity, 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 varsity hockey team, co-op team. And right. between what we collect from the, the arrangement with the um, co-op program. We've probably covered about four thousand dollars. It would go up if we, if we, you know, didn't have the policy as it is. So, what is the difference for our current varsity hockey team? What is the difference between what we charge as a user fee and what the school district provides? We don't break it down that yeah, way. We yeah, we don't. We don't. Because every sport pays the same amount of money. Yeah. Right. So, so it just goes into a big pot. Right, but shouldn't that, that the, the difference be covered that way also for our girls? Well, you, I think what would happen right. is you'd say, I'm sorry, we can't adapt right. a co-op. I don't think we'd offer the yeah. co-op anymore. We're doing it because it's what people have wanted. It's an opportunity for people to be. Right. They could still play for our team. Well, the girls could go out for the boys' team. Or in the case of, like, yeah. gymnastics, we just wouldn't have the team. There's, we wouldn't be able to subsidize it. 
Well, I, but we have yeah. girls basketball and boys basketball. And, and that's right, but what, we don't have enough. What you do? You have yeah. to have enough players. I understand that. Oh, so if you only have six or seven girls who want to play hockey, right. the option that's about that's about that's the number. About what it, that's yeah. what it is. Right. It started I think at three actually back right. a couple years ago. It's kind of it's grown. Um, ten uh, many years ago, they tried to have a girls program here, and I don't think enough girls. Yeah, with Wilmington, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Right? Several years. So what ago. about the the JV hockey? How does that work? That's a that's a user fee. In our existing program, yes. that's a regular user fee, the $400, 200 yeah. 200 And then the difference in cost is what, how, how is that paid for? The boosters were paying the for ice time. They were paying for ice time, but they're actually in a, in a kind of a three-year phase, right, phase out their Correct. contribution for that. Right. I think, are we in year two? We're in year, I think it's year three. Year three? Yeah. So ultimately, we will absorb the difference. Or, yeah. you know. Or we won't offer it. Uh, well, I don't know that. I mean, we might have to revisit with the group and say, look, we need to discuss with you some options going forward. But I think that's, as of that's, to, a, that's a very likely possibility. As of today, I think the athletic program is 47% covered oh, by fees yeah, and 53% by the town the, uh, it's a, it's like, appropriations, yeah, something like that. Yeah. And does that include the co-op numbers in there as it currently is situated? I would think, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, So there's total program. Our athletic program is about is about six hundred thousand, six hundred thousand dollars. As coaches' right. salaries right. yeah. and yeah. fee, yeah. coaches' salaries alone are three hundred something. I yeah. think. So it's about that's yeah. correct. And the yeah, the revenue that we collect collect from user fee or gate receipts is about two hundred. Yeah, two hundred. I was like two seventy, so two hundred eighty five thousand. Over three hundred thousand. You know, one of one of the issues that we don't want to get into, and this would we don't want to, I don't think we want to do, is charge different um, fees per sport. Mm -hmm. Schools that have done that, they've, their programs have been decimated. But essentially we are. No, we're not. We, we are. We are. No, we're not. This, it's a co-op program. It's yeah, not I our, it's not our we sport. Are. We're, we're treating co-ops different than sports that we offer. Because it's not a sport we offer. Correct. I'm saying if, if. But it's North Reading students participating in a public but we're giving them an option. Program. We don't have, the point is, we don't have to I understand do that. that. So if parents don't want to pay, then we won't do it. I mean, we, I, we can't I, subsidize. I understand the point yeah, that you're absolutely. making. I, I understand it. I, I don't. Clarify what what it is. I don't. What, what, I, I, I understand it. I'm, that's, the, that's the reason I'm asking these questions. I was not aware that this is. Yeah. The, the school format. committee recently adopted the co-op policy. That's a that's a new a new po fairly year, new policy on what the arrangement was going to be for the fee structure. I wasn't here. I guess I, I don't. I'm just raising. I'm just bringing it up because we saw that the, the subsidizing of it by the district was not going to be something. So it was either we weren't going to be able to offer the students the opportunity to play, yeah. or this is an arrangement that we can make for you if you want to have it that way. And people are signing on to do that. I mean, our co-op, our wrestling program. Started as a co-op with Linfield, it had three students from uh, South Reading at one time. I mean, I think the difference is, and I see Julie's point here, is that the the large fee. It's uh, a the, huge. But the point is, burden for the point families. is, if we can't, you know, we we could well, go back and say offer no co-ops. May not be though, because think about it: if you have two children that play two sports, you know, I mean, that that possibility exists too. If you have one child that plays one sport, and this is the sport, right. it's a yeah. it's a financial burden that they might not otherwise realize. But I if agree. You have one if it, if, daughter, right? right. That I'm just saying, if hockey. if that's the situation, that is true. But there, the the other possibility also exists that if you have two children playing two sports, right. you make out. You know what I mean? That's so that that's all I'm saying is it, all those possibilities exist because what you know I don't know what PBD charges their girls to play hockey but I can guarantee you it's not fourteen hundred I, I would be willing to bet that it's not PBD is charging us fourteen hundred dollars to subsidize their program yeah. Yeah. so you know and and I know Dave Johnson's tried to negotiate with PBD too mm -hmm. and he really has he hasn't been successful I, mean, I think I think we all I think we both under understand that there's where where you got to that point I'm just trying to understand what it was because I understand saying we don't have enough for our own team and so the option is either don't have a team and nobody can play or you have the co-op and the cost for just a few students would be excessive and you can't afford to pay it I understand that's where we got there whether or not it's fair or not is another, another, another. So if we have six another. students playing, we're going to pay $5,500. <laughs> so why don't other parents come to us and say, 
Well, why are you subsidizing them? Well, I don't think anybody's proposing that right now. We're just trying to understand. No, but I'm just saying, if we're going to subsidize some students, we should subsidize all of them. That was June of 16. So, I, I, I mean, I'm looking at it here, yeah. well, Right, so what are you getting at there? So why should we sub, so should we, if some parent says, well, I don't really want to be paying 400 for cross country, you should subsidize me $300 because cross country is not worth $400. Well, and we say, oh, well, wait a minute. No, but the, the difference is saying you're treating a co-op sport because there's not a lot of other interest different than you're, you're treating a sport where there is enough interest to have a team here. No, we're treating co-op sports differently because we don't set the fees. And we tell parents that up front. We don't set the fees, whatever the fee is, from that other but school. we're absorbing the hockey costs. We're, we're not yeah, absorbing. Can I make, can we're absorbing I make a over 1,300. Can I make a suggestion? I'm sorry. No, here. because I, I, we, have a, we have a policy in place. You're adhering to the policy. That's, your policy is as of June of 20, 2016. I think if there's a desire to look at that differently, then maybe that's something that you might want to have the policy. Yeah, I'd like to understand what absorbing the hockey costs mean. What, what does that mean? We're absorbing, we're absorbing tennis costs when we were renting the tennis place for $25,000 a year. We're not doing that anymore. I mean, okay, so our North Reading students could play tennis. Right. So, so how is that different than what we're offering? Because we students? don't have the program. Well, the tennis would be different because we took the tennis courts away to right. build the school. Sure. So. Well, that was our thing. But I mean, I guess I don't under, the, the 400, all the fee money goes into one pot to cover all the sports. Oh, I get that. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm, and the hockey boosters raise a lot of money too. I, I'm just trying to understand what you mean by subsidizing the hot. I don't understand. Yeah, don't look at, I'm, I'm looking at the fairness of, of the fee. Well, you'd have to look at the I think you'd, I think you'd have to, I, it's not an, an exact in, comparison in program. It's a cooperative program that's offered as an alternative to I the program that, that we, that, so I don't yeah. know that it's, it's not like we're charging $500 to play basketball and $100 to play golf. That, well, I yeah, get that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I don't know that, but I think to say that we're, you know, doing something for one that we're not doing right. for the other, I don't know is exactly a, think, fair, a fair comparison is what some, I'm saying. Summary on how we kind of got to that policy was, you know, pre before that policy was adopted in June of 2016, I believe the parents were actually paying the full Peabody fee, which could be as much as 1500 or more, given whatever, whatever that year was. See, my so interpretation of that was we were paying, the, the students would be responsible for either Peabody's student fee, not necessarily the whole cost of the ICE program. Oh, so that's when you're saying we're subsidizing the, the hockey. Well, it reads I if, get what you're if, saying now. It reads if the I fee charged by the school hosting the cooperative team is equal to or more than the North Reading Public Schools athletic user fee, the student will be responsible for paying to the North Reading. I thought it had to do with their user fee, not the cost of the program. Well, that is their user fee. That is their user fee. That's what they say their user fee is. But not what Peabody students are paying. No. 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 That was my interpretation of it. Yeah, I don't know. We don't, we don't have control of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I have no, we would have no idea what that, at the time, we wouldn't know that. I could, that could fluctuate. I understand where we're at right now, and the reality is not uh, not before us to try to change it right now. We're just no, but in, we're trying to you know if life like was if everything was equal in life, it's not fair. But we just look at I mean I look at we're giving them an opportunity to play, and if we we have to be careful about subsidizing things because then we might have to start subsidizing other things or that we can't afford. You know, no, I, yeah, I, I understand. I mean, clearly we're, we're subsidizing that. things. No, but because I'm, we're only the the user fee is only covering what forty seven percent to pay for our sports. So the the school district is subsidizing our athletic program. Right, but I'm saying subsidizing specific fee payers. So if we started saying, well, we're only going to charge the kids to play hockey four hundred dollars in the school district will cover nine hundred that's a different yeah but that's what happened that is what is no, happening. no it's not we're fun I, mean, we I think we're funding, funding the athletic program, program. I don't know that it's a sub a subsidy of right we're funding athletic. varsity hockey but we're paying more than four hundred dollars per student like our, our, their user fee is not covering the cost of varsity hockey who's we're absorbing fee? that that's right? that's likely true yeah, yeah. right but that's the same case for but girls the, hockey too because right? we're we're probably paying Peabody a bill of you know, eight or $9,000, which we're collecting about $4,000. So 
So there is. So I think we need to go back to Peabody and renegotiate our contract. Well, we, we've so tried. They, we've they're tried not going to renegotiate. We've, we've so tried that. It's accepted and have that opportunity there, or, or not accepted and not have that right. opportunity there. I think that's that's where I think we've reached with Peabody, unfortunately. Yeah. It's not for a lack of trying. Yeah. But are there other districts that we can? We were with we Wilmington. We tried. We and then they yeah. Wilmington started their own team. I think we tried was. to be just with Linfield, who also was a Correct. member of the same co-op, but there wasn't enough participation between Linfield. Right. And North we were trying to bring it just to, to the two own, communities. To have its own team. So. I mean, it's the problem with co-op sports. I know you're not happy, but I not booster happy club. At all. The booster club. I just, I just don't understand what, else, what else we could do, I have a other question. than not, not offer it. Jen, in well, there is another you, solution. Um, we pay for it. You could pay for some. Yes. That's the other option. The school district. I would never pays approve that, but. Okay. There, there are other options. There's three options. It seems like there's a compromise position which has been accepted. Again, why would we pay for some students' fees but not others? And again, I'll go back to students fee, So why doesn't the field uh, the no, you would have them have the same cap of four hundred dollars per person? But for cross country, if I, I'm a cross country parent, I'm going to say, "Geez, my four hundred dollars is subsidizing every other sport. I don't want to pay four hundred. So you got to stop su start subsidizing my well, cross country you're treating, kids. You're treating every single student the same. The concern right now is you're not treating every student the same. Four programs offered by North Reading High School. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't. I don't agree. I, understand. With, I don't agree with that statement. Well, I would be concerned We're providing also an with Title IX violations. We're providing an opportunity. With Title IX violations. We don't, we don't have to offer the sport. We're giving girls an opportunity to play hockey that we don't have enough students to play here. How is that a Title IX violation? Well, I just they're, think they're allowed to play on the boys' hockey. They can play on the boys' hockey. It's, it's not a boys' hockey. It's boys hockey. It's, 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 it's yeah, hockey. hockey. Just like boys are allowed to play right. field hockey if they want, or boys can play volleyball. So The only sports that... Or the bo boys and girls are said. In fact, the girls could play baseball and boys so could play softball. So I think perhaps softball. during budget season, this can become a topic of discussion. We discuss away. I'm not approving anything, but. Okay, I have a question. Um, if and and you probably know this, and yeah. it's more because I think she's taken on a whole lot. But um, traditionally, is it just like a two-man team? My concern too. Of the uh, board? Yeah. Yeah. Um, One person has almost yeah, every not position. We yeah, it's not, it's, not an, it's not odd. Yeah. No. Okay. And certainly, there's only six people. There's well, only, it's I only know. for six. Yeah. Just like, she's very gracious with her <laughs> doing this. Yeah. Yes. No, as I said, I, I, great. I mean, and you know, she had the same questions <clears throat> brought up earlier, and she met with Dave Johnson, talked with me several times. And I said that that's the fee they charge. And you know, I, I, we have a policy that we're adhering to the policy, our policy. So. No, I, w I just I thought that was very nice of her to. She's the president, treasurer, clerk, and director. <laughs> yes. That's not unusual. I mean, I've seen that when I pull. Yeah. I mean, it's by state uh, guidelines of. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure it was. It was fine because it's um, made it through. But I just wanted to apologize to it. Yeah. So. Well, we so now that we emotion? now that we've exercised our demons, <laughs> um, <laughs> all of us. There's emotion. <clears throat> I, I will recommend that adherence to school co school committee policy LEC, the North Reading School Committee rec vote to recognize. The North Reading High School Varsity Girls Hockey Boosters as a support group and authorized school administration to work collaboratively, collaboratively with, with it should, them. It should say with the group, yeah. With the group for the betterment of the North Reading Public Schools. Second. For the discussion. <laughs> I, and I will say um, it's a legitimate topic for a budget discussion. Mm -hmm. I, for one, will not budge on my position. If we want to change the policy, we can change the policy. That's something for the policy. Maybe the policy subcommittee wants to, this. you can put this on a future agenda. We can look at it. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, right? I mean, the we, we can have difference of opinions. No, but I'm saying yeah. if yes. the only yeah. way to change what we're doing is to change the policy. Correct. So that's Correct. the policy subcommittee has to and I, and I, and review that. In full disclosure, I voted for that policy and yeah. didn't fully understand it. 
and clearly now I do. But again, the but again, the policy we shouldn't have a policy if the budget won't support it. So it's you sort of a chicken and the egg. What do you do first? If you try to push a policy through and then you have to support it with the budget, it's probably better to start with the discussion with budget if we can afford it before we change the policy. Right. You know, we wouldn't want to change the policy and then not be able to afford what that meant. Yeah, they, you know, the, the worst to... the worst thing would be if for some reason we get into this and then we don't have any collaboratives offered. I think we all agree that this is better than them not being able to play. And I would say the um, bottom line is it would be great if we could find a better um, opportunity for our girls. I yeah. I know that that has been explored. I know. <clears throat> I think we should yeah. do that yearly, just as I, we look Dave, for ice Dave time been, yearly. You know. Dave has. We been understand that. the dilemma it poses. Yeah. Believe me, it's not for lack <coughs> of trying. Mm -hmm. Dave, I know Dave We've meets with going Peabody with every year, and it's okay. there's just not a big Check. draw for it, unfortunately. I wish we had enough girls; we could have our own team. I do too, and it would be solved. Okay. All those in favor of the. Second. I second. All those in favor of approval, the motion to approve the North Reading High School Varsity Girls Hockey Boosters. Aye. Aye. Opposed? 4 0. Thank you. So I did have one other item under my uh, budgetary update. Um, oh, that's right. It's, it's a student activity quarterly report. Um, so in compliance with recently updated student activity uh, school committee policy, as well as in compliance with new student activity regulations, um, we are required to present quarterly reports on the status of all student activity accounts to the school committee. So the information that I have included in the quarterly report includes certified reconciled quarterly account balances of all five student activity accounts. I've also listed the active sub accounts in their quarterly account balance at the middle school and the high school. So those are the accounts that we actually have sub account balances um, within the, the larger you know, student activity account balance. Um, so again, you know, just as a part of the new student activity regulations, the listing of sub accounts does need to be approved annually by a vote of the school committee. So we, as you, as you may recall, and I'll remind you, fresh your memory, we, had, we did go through an audit, an independent outside audit mm -hmm. last spring, and that was one of the recommendations um, as a result of that audit, is that we actually have the school committee vote annually the listing of, of all the sub accounts. So as part of this quarterly report, review <coughs> and the information that I'm providing this evening, I will be asking the committee, and there's a recommended motion on the first page of the memorandum included in the packet, um, do take a formal vote um, of approval of the current active 2017-18 um, school year middle school and high school you know, sub accounts um, th th this evening. I have a question, but uh, about one thing. But some other members may have a question after looking through the numbers. So, I'll, anybody else have a question? So I, have, well, I have one question, which is just it says active clubs. So, um, clubs with zero balance, I understand that you can still have a club with no money in there, mm -hmm. but I just want to confirm all of those clubs are active even if they have a zero balance? All these clubs are active. It may mean have a zero balance on this quarter ending September 30th, but you could be doing fundraising later on in the school year and they would have a balance later, later on this year. Well, this is probably right. I don't remember the photography club. Is that an older one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah, some of these go back several years. Um, you may see some recent ones that were adopted over the last few years. Um, but we did early act has been has just come off of a pilot at the middle school. Students for Soldiers is a new one. Right. Yep. So. Um, really, photography plug just club. Just a, a question about maskers. I hey, that's what I was going to ask. That's all fundraising, right? Donations, fundraising. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So they, that's certainly high as they get ready, obviously, to do their production. Um, so they'll they'll have a lot of expenses this month and next month as they prepare for their December production. So it's not unusual that they'll have a high balance. So so Michael, here's so I know that it costs it, it costs real lot to put the musical on, right? Correct. But that just seems like a lot of money. Do we do we get a report on what on everything that what they spend it on? In other words, what, how deep do you go? so say it costs 
twenty thousand to get the rights to Beauty and the Beast. I don't. I know it's it's a lot. We we every expense comes through. So you get you'll get that you'll get all those reports everything. Every, yes. So uh, every deposit every um, you know, receipt and every expense is processed okay. through my office and we record it all on. Um, Excel spreadsheets and we reconcile that to be but that has to be all fundraising how else right is it? Oh, so, from that. so what is the district does the district provide any anything toward their production or is that just fundraising um, yeah we don't yeah we don't right. yeah, the, all, the, the well no the, what we what we pay there's like seven or eight advisors, yeah, advisors. Right. Right. like twelve thousand right. dollars or something right. but right. that's right. true of all but no <laughs> there's no but some of that's offset by the I, and a lot of that's from the program book, right? I assume. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of this also, I mean, they, they, they carry over. I mean, this money belongs to the students. It belongs to the Masters Club. That's kind of you know, how the regulations of student activity uh, funds you know, operate. So some of this has been there from prior years. I mean, they don't spend all the way down to the penny okay. you know, every year. So they've been in existence for a number of years. Right. You know, they've worked up you know, a balance from year to year that they carry over. And you know, I think at times you know, they could you know, put some money back into, um, you know, their organization, that, you know, their program. Are they limited as to how much they, like, I know, um, you know, like when I was involved with soccer or lacrosse, there was, at, at a certain level, they'd have to spend some money. They couldn't just continue to roll over the money. They were 501 um, C3. what, right. C3s. Is that different than the way this is this treated? Is different. <clears throat> so they're not limited. I mean, I think we, um, have a recommended that no checking account balance exceed $125,000 at the high school. So we are, our balance of 111, 313 okay. is within that 125 threshold. Um, so I believe it's 25 at the middle school and 125 at, at the high school. So all the money is in one account. Correct. So 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 all the monies are in each of these five accounts. So at the high school, it's all in one account. Um, but then we obviously. <coughs> Keep our separate set of books and break that down by these sub accounts. And how so? If Maskers want Maskers needs to cut a check for the musicians for the orchestra at ten thousand dollars, do they have to make a request to you and then you cut the check, or does Town Hall cut the check? So they make the request first to uh, Michael Downs and AJ Lapret, and right. they approve that request. Yep. It then comes down to my office. I then approve it, and then it goes to the Town Hall. And then the Town cuts the check. Check by okay. the statute. Okay. Okay. Just another question about the elementary um, student activity accounts. What exactly are student activity accounts so at these, the elementary these are all, level? These, at the elementary level, there's no sub accounts because it's all class field trips. It's all you know money coming in for. Um, like that? Does that include enrichment or no, no. that's just field trips? This is yeah. Okay. This is class field trips. So it's money that's been collected for Correct. class field trips that was there on September 30th. Correct. Okay. So, I mean, we've, we've certainly worked hard um, over the summer months and into the fall, you know, making sure that we're adhering to the recommendations by the auditor when they came out last spring and then the policy that we put into actions uh, in action was adopted in August. So, um, you know, we worked really closely with the town accounting office and the town treasurer, you know, throughout the summer to, to make sure that we're going through this you know, quarterly certification process and um, everything's reconciled, you know, to, to the bank statements, to, a, to our accounting system. So I think it's come a long way and I think, um, I think we have a pretty good system down. Um, and uh, we reconciled everything down to the penny. I know it's getting very late, but like, what are the, are there guidelines is that everybody gets as to what they can spend this money on? So they know before they send you a request or AJ and, and Michael Downs request that if they, they know that not to request, you know, to buy X because it's not going to yeah. get approved. So there, um, the whole student activity regulation procedure manual that's attached to the, the larger school committee policy language that governs um, or, or provides guidance to what the, what the receipts should be, what the expenses should be, what the kind of this, the, this okay. the request should be. If there are requests for reimbursement, what their required documentation should be, and um, so those guidelines are are presented and, and, and published, and they're certainly the club advisors, and each club is made aware of them, and it's certainly all ad ad adhering to Chapter 71, <coughs> which is the law that, that governs 
Okay. And the student activity process. And, and Michael also meets, has a has a physical meeting with the advisors did, yeah. and explains procedures to so there's, annually. Yeah, there's annual <clears throat> training that goes on. So we I meet with the advisors at you know the high school, um, you know separately, and we go through um, the handbook and the training. And, um, and then I also meet with the secretaries at the elementary level, who are mainly the ones you know handling the, the, the receipts and the expenses, and we we kind of go through the um, and we do an annual training and answer questions. Just a, an, a follow-up question. So these are, I mean, I would assume like whether they're donations or fundraising, and this is not all these numbers aren't you know in that big spreadsheet that you give us with donations, right? Correct. No, so these no, are above and beyond above that and this, this is what separate. people have fundraised or yeah, parents by, have donated. By statute, it's it's really considered you know property of the students. You know, this is this is the the source. You know, it's a source, and you, the source of the funds is money generated from, from students. And it's so this is above students. and beyond. This is all yeah. above and beyond. It's huge. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. Huge. Um, Any other questions? Someone want to read the. I'll make motion. a motion that the school committee vote to approve the list of active student activity accounts at the high school, middle school, and I believe elementary schools um, for the 2017-2018 school year as presented by the administration. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Four zero. Nice job, Michael. Thank you for keeping us up to date on that. Thank you. Okay, we've got uh, uh, staffing, no staffing. No staffing. Reports, bids and donations, we have a few. <laughs> Julie, okay. Or something you want to say? No, something. this is one of the greatest <laughs> donations we've ever gotten. I just want to know what the what the contribution was exactly. The assistance was. Did he? What Cliff's he, assistance? Did he, I don't know. I, did he, did he, did I he try, drove, did delivered he them. The new <laughs> I know the answer to that question. Did he try the new equipment out? <laughs> Mr. Bowers wrote to Michael and I one one afternoon. He asked yeah. for Firestone to be recognized as kind of more of a community spirit type of thing. He had he had uh, gone to them and, and asked for tires, and they very graciously agreed to donate tires, and I think what Cliff did was he installed them on a piece of equipment that's used right. by the football team, like a throwing kind of a target thing. And um, so we asked him to just try to put a monetary value to it. But I think he was, he was more, I think, um, wanting for a public acknowledgement of the contribution that Firestone made, so. Excellent. Motion second, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Four zero. Let's make a motion to the committee vote to accept the gratitude a donation of one hundred dollars from the Mass Coalition of Nurse Practitioners to purchase supplies for Jolene Damien's classroom at the middle school. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Four zero. Let's make a motion that the school committee vote to accept the gratitude a donation of five hundred dollars from the reimbursement specialist. Second. For the discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Four zero. This is the commission of the school committee vote to accept the status of the donation of $1,581.80 from the North Reading Middle School Parents Association to purchase 220 Chromebook sleeves for the second grade. Second. For the discussion? These are, it, uh, these are the ones they were selling, right? Correct. Okay. The so they did the NR on it? <coughs> They did that as a fundraiser, so they purchased them, and then the idea was to mm -hmm. recoup the money through uh, the sale. Right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Four, zero. Okay. Subcommittee updates, is that where we are? Yes. Um, athletic subcommittee pretty much already talked about the um, softball request. Um, the school board for the softball field. Uh, the new softball field kind of remains in limbo because um, the school committee has committed to paying out of the budget for the scoreboard, but the cost we got for installation was 
one and a half times the cost of the scoreboard. Correct. So the money isn't there, and we need to raise funds. That's why we're talking with youth, uh, with North Reading Girls Softball about that. Um, we also just talked about the, the budget. We're pretty much on budget in terms of the fees collected in the first uh, for the fall season. And the winter season we'll be getting soon. Correct, Michael, is that right after Thanksgiving? Monday. Yeah, yeah Monday after That's Thanksgiving. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that was, oh, we also discussed the restroom facility, but I'll get that at the turf field, but I'll get mm -hmm. to that on the um, athletic facilities. I think that was pretty much it. There wasn't, uh, wasn't yeah. a whole lot on the agenda. Yeah. yeah. So next we have uh, policy subcommittee. I think we've pretty much covered that yep. tonight. We've been going through the MASC recommendations. And secondary school building committee, there really wasn't. It was a short meeting. I think the the the, the glass at the cafeteria is still the one. The right biggest thing is it was supposed <coughs> to be our last meeting. Right. right. The end. Huh. But now, we're, but now we're meeting tomorrow night. And we can't. the The biggest issue outstanding is there's one more invoice for Gilbain, but they have to de to deliver some things before the committee will approve That's the correct. invoice. Well, as of, I think I said earlier, Thursday, I spoke with Don Kelleher, yeah. and he had said that he hasn't seen anything yet. So that means that unless they slipped it to him real quick. NORCAM, Scott? So at the last <coughs> NORCAM meeting, I think the, the one thing I would bring up that, it, that impacts the schools potentially, but not really, is just the INET issue that's happening. They're negotiating the... Um, the deal with Comcast right now. <clears throat> Comcast doesn't want to support the INET going forward, and there's a potential loss of the INET, or the, if if something goes wrong with it. And I'm not 100% sure what INET does. You see, you, Mr. Webster, I think has more information, and Mr. I think Julie does too, because it was discussed at Capital. Uh, the INET basically is the kind of the hub for the whole town in terms of networking and etc. But we're talking about and, Capital, right? What's so. Apparently, North Reading has been getting this free of right. charge as far as municipal business. From Comcast. Yes, from Comcast. Now Comcast is um, like discontinuing or wanting to discontinue our use of that INET for municipal buildings. I don't believe NORCAM falls under that. Michael, do you recall from the meeting? It sounded like it was North a separate. Cam is yeah. separate. Yeah. Yeah. North Cam I, I spoke to the yeah. town administrator today, and that's what so he North indicated. North Cam is separate. It wouldn't necessarily affect North Cam, but right. That's, that's, my that's my understanding. So the town is looking at options. Yeah. Michael would know. Yes. Yeah. I can speak to this because I'm on the board. <laughs> right. So what it is, <clears throat> North Bay was getting the INET service for free because they were actually violating the contract. A lot of towns were doing it. The INET was originally provided by the cable providers, in this case Comcast, for video only. So oh. the network was set up to be able to run video from, say, school building back to a hub and off to the what they call the head end of the cable company so that you could broadcast your school committee meeting or your uh, select meetings or all that kind of that the contract basically said that's all this network is to be used for. And a lot of towns, like York Reading, decided, hey, we're going to start putting other things on here, data. Right, this bandwidth there, we're going to use it, right? Right, yeah. so we're going to use it. What Comcast is saying is this was never intended for this purpose. It says so right here in this document, and you have to stop using it. Now, that leaves the town with kind of options. I mean, some towns are building their own. So other towns are trying to, you know, see if files will help them out. You know, there's a bunch of options out there. Yeah. But, but basically, we were never using it the way it was intended. Okay. And now they're, they're not going to support it. So, so Comcast is calling us on it now, right? Right. Yeah. Right. So if something went wrong with the <coughs> you know, data from the, the from town hall or, or, or whatnot, Comcast would say it wasn't supposed to be there to put it. Okay. And they wouldn't help, help out. Okay. So something's got to be figured out. What Norcam has been trying to do is, is uh, 
fluctuate yeah. about when they want the towns to be off it. And obviously that's a big piece of information. Yeah. So Julie, what was what was the discussion at CIPC? Was it looking to raise funds to or possibly pos fund, fund the our own creation? Cre uh, creating a new, yeah, which would be pretty expensive, I assume. Those numbers, yeah. I don't know how yeah. how valid those yeah. numbers yeah. are, <coughs> but that's but they it's all with the contract negotiations that are happening. Nothing with Comcast really can right be now, okay. Decided until that's figured out. Okay. Anything else, Scott? Well, the only other thing would just was Mr. Uh, uh, Scandal at the meeting mentioned that in his role with the transcript, they're trying to do more um, stories on the school outside of athletics. And so I just think I'd bring it up here as well that if there are programs going on, if there's things that should be publicized, that the transcript is trying to have more material on, on the schools here that are outside of just athletics. So, you know, it seems the like transcript or not? The transcript. I, I have two hats on. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Only two? That's it? Brought up at that meeting, but it was a transcript. <laughs> and so if there are if there if there are things going on in the schools that we want to publicize, it seems like there's a, a commitment to try to do more, you know, more words on it in the transcript every week. So I thought that right. was good to point out. Uh, then the finance planning team, basically the main discussion was uh, we talked about town meeting because oh no that was post town meeting or post town post meeting um, we talked about when we laid out our costs the, the cost for the costs operations that we have of this building operations of the building a little bit of an update on the uh, Pulte project right but there really wasn't much um, oh and the town's going to take a new approach to budgeting that kind of mirrors what we do strategic planning and which is more rather than saying you're coming in with a you know a um, level services budget or a level budget, level funded budget, what are things you think you need, like the way we kind of do it here, and then we winnow, winnow down what, to what we can afford, basically, which isn't the greatest way to do it, but, so there may be some things coming out of the town this year that'll be a little different in terms of- The idea of, of a strategic plan and, right. and trying to fund that was something right. that Selectman Prisco, especially, I got the yeah. sense was- yeah. Ties more into right ties more into strategic needs versus Correct. just saying <clears throat> here's a dollar amount and you make it work right. I think that was the main thing. Um, Athletic facilities committee. We actually met um, to endorse to vote take a vote on uh, uh, a change order, which was for the brick finish on the building, which was I think eleven thousand two hundred and thirty dollars yeah. or something yeah. like that, and it was approved by the, the selectmen have to approve all change orders, and it was approved by the selectmen. Uh, there are two other items. Um, one is related to the fire alarm, which I think we're actually going to spend a lot less on than we thought we had to. Mm -hmm. um, there was discussion that the fire alarm had a tie into the existing one on the team building, and it doesn't, the last I heard. And there's also, uh, we're, we're getting a cost. There are a number of things, I think we talked about this, that were tied to the electrical circuit in the old concession stand that have to be reconnected. And we had gotten a price, but I believe we were trying to see if it actually should have been covered under the original contract, <coughs> and if not, whether the price should be less than what they had quoted us, correct? And I think there was some optimism. Was, right, there was some optimism. The town's that position too. on that. So. We have enough funds to cover this with a contingency fee. The project is going on, it's ongoing right now. The foundation is being put in. I know the rebar was there. I don't know if they've poured the concrete yet. Um, they hope to be done. I don't think they put the concrete. Pardon me? I don't believe the concrete has been. I think they hope they would be done within the next two two weeks or so, and then the building will come in. The, the, the brick finish is put on the building at the facility in Connecticut, the company that's building the building. So that's all good, and uh, everything seems to be on schedule for March 15th. Correct. Opening, and then finish sometime in April, early May, with the paving of the paved areas. And we went, the, we went down to see the layout of the building, and everything seems to be where we thought it would be. We picked out the uh, paint color. Right, picked out paint color. Subsequent meeting. Right. With the, with the, uh, in the partition colors right. and some of the kind of aesthetic things for the in interior. Yeah, so that's all been, that's all been selected. Correct. <clears throat> and uh, should be ready to go. And that's it. Subcommittee meeting is coming up. I guess there is an athletic subcommittee meeting tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to guess that um, 
I'll raise it. So I know that there'll be discussion on there about the uh, fee for girls hockey will be discussed tomorrow in addition to um, softball uh, costs. Um, there's SSBC meeting tomorrow, NORCAM November 16th, policy subcommittee November 21st, and finance planning team <coughs> December 5th. Should we plan meetings for other new committees at some point, and how do we do that? Our new subcommittees? I'm going to recommend that. John send out dates. I think on the budget committee, kind of, we, I think when we're ready, would you say, is that like a fair? Yeah. When we think was there's something, we have enough information to share with the committee. We'll just speak to those two members. Who's the budget? Me and you. When we're at a point when we think, I mean, we'll yeah. meet whenever you want. Okay. I mean, do you want do you want to meet with us? Is that how you want it to meet? The committee would be the floor. I would think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I would think with some time within, I mean, when yeah. you start having some. When we have some substance. Substance, say, so right. Yeah. 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 We'll kind of reach out and say, <coughs> you know, give you a couple of options. To, yeah. And then I think the same thing with the, with, with uh, um, the committee that sure. Scott and Jerry are on, the con contract reviews. I'd like to get that pretty quickly because. So I have the info. I emailed yeah. Mr. Buckley today and said I had, <laughs> I had had Ann put together some packets of information for both he and Jerry to. But I think if we want to get something, you guys can probably meet on the calendar independently. Of that one. That's fine. Hoping. Okay. Good. That's fine. Excellent. I'll assist you without you. <laughs> uh, administrative reports. You got something, Mr. Chairman? The only thing I was going to share is some good news. There were there were sixty. I I did pass something out to you. We, um, and again, I think this helps. I want to present this because it's the right thing to do, and it's a it's a nice honor. But also, I. I think the committee was interested this year as one of its goals on, on doing a little bit more in the way of public recognition. So there were 63 students from the class of 2019 at the high school who have been named recipients of the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship for their performance on the last spring's MCAS exam. So um, the criteria is not uh, is not weak. It is it is it is I think uh, reflective students' achievement levels at, at the highest levels of the advanced and proficient car categories now across all three um, exams, including the science exam, which is fairly new. I think this is maybe year three with that, um, and represents also the top 25 percent of scores um, in the um, graduating class. So a nice, and I think that the, the transcript has probably been covered for, yeah, okay. That's typical. So. That's typically what we do. I haven't seen. I don't. I didn't see the paper. I was here the day she took it. Okay. So that was probably the day of the reality fair. Yeah. Okay. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, future business regular meetings: December fourth, December eighteenth, and January eighth, two thousand eighteen. All here. When will we have our first? Uh, yeah. When's our first field trip? I think it's the, well, the field, you have the first school presentation. Oh, it's on, here, right? It's on <laughs> December 18th. Okay. That's it's, it's here in the middle meeting. Oh, that's the high school presentation here. Right. Okay. I think January you go to the batch elder. Okay. Great. Anything else? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn or is it too early? <laughs> too early. Uh, you send some good wishes to Jerry. Who made the motion? Did, oh, you made the motion? Motion by Janine, second by Julie. All's in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed?